Do we have a word for it? Tom, anytime you're ready, you can go. Okay, yeah, right. It is two o'clock Central European time. Good. So, uh, and we, have, how many more hours do we have? Is it three or four? I've lost track. We planned since 10 till 6, so, but we four, included four an extra break. I don't know how about participants if they... Uh, no, 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 I mean, participants uh, can come and go. If I'm yeah. the only one left, I will stop. But if one person <laughs> remains, it will go. And, and, it, and we have the recording, so even though people have to go, can pick it up later, so. No, okay, so good, we can go four more hours. And there will be a break, ten, about 10 minutes to the hour. Yeah. The hour, and uh, okay, so I'm on slide 30. Six, um, yeah, uh, so, so um, now uh, here's, here's, here's this idea about scale parameters. This is a technical term. I uh, always put scale parameters with capital letters because they are defined terms, formally defined. That's my general signal in the whole of language. Capital letters means it's defined or should be defined somewhere. But uh, uh, so uh, scale parameters. Now I always put scale parameters in square brackets, uh, which is a way of signaling it's not just a defined term; it's a scale parameter. So it has special properties, which we'll we'll look at. Uh, but what what it's saying is this is a general term, which has a number of conditions which define it, and uh, you have to find out uh, in when you have a goal you have to say exactly, you know, which person type it is. In this case, all means all of the conditions are valid. Uh, yeah, so, so here, here's, here's the uh, people, uh, okay, and, and then here's the definition, people as a uh, term is, is uh, by the way, this is the set parentheses, so it's a set of things. It could be babies and or children and or adults and or aged, so, as, a, as a set. Uh, let's see. They are general concepts, but they are not ambiguous and they are not unclear. A lot of people mix up the idea of generality with ambiguity and lack of clarity, and these are two different things. <coughs> um, here's the diagram I showed earlier, uh, written by my Polish friend Anna Krolowska. Her actual email is in the previous one. She's a uh, UX designer and graphical artist. So I said, make me a good design or graphical picture of the scale parameters and their conditions. So thanks to her, I have this. Now, you take a look at this one scale of measure, and I'm talking to people who have no scales of measure at all. So the whole idea of even having a quantified idea is itself a complication they're feeling uncomfortable with. And then in addition, I plug in this even more advanced idea of, of uh, scale parameters, many of them. We often have uh, uh, three to six scale parameters in a typical uh, scale. Uh, that might seem complicated. You know, it's like too much, I'm overwhelmed. And, and I understand if many of you listening today feel a little bit overwhelmed with too many ideas, uh, don't worry about it. Um, uh, you know, just give your time to absorb them uh, if you just walk away with one conclusion, further study is necessary and desirable, that's good. Okay. Now, it turns out that complicated is one observation, but in fact, I view this as a way of simplifying very complex problems. So here's a very complex problem. Security has many dimensions, and here is one dimension, the attack, and here's another attention, the, the, the effect of the attack, and here's another dimension. And there are all kinds of combinations of all of these. So let's just say there are uh, 5,000 combinations and five, at times all the levels and dates when you could have a, 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 something on the scale. So this is horrible complexity, isn't it? But wait a minute, this is fairly simple. <laughs> this is fairly simple compared to thousands, okay? So uh, by organizing the scale parameters and the conditions and the use of it, that like I'm doing here, uh, I view this as a way of making a complex world. I, we're modeling a complex world 
And it's very simple compared to the actual complexity that's there. So if you're interested, you realize this, uh, I, uh, somebody once pointed out that uh, computer programs are the most complex things on the planet, even more complex than the human brain. Okay. So we, IT people, are incredibly complex territory, and we need all the tools we can get to simplify things. By the way, I've written several papers on complexity, simplification, and scaling. And if you don't find them in, you should find them in the, the reference. But if you don't find them and you say, I'm terribly interested in scaling, complexity, and simplicity, uh, email me, I'll send you them. Uh, but uh, so I, I've been, uh, a, lot, a lot of the tools here, they're about trying to make complexity simpler, trying to deal with complexity. Um, what we're doing is we're extracting something very simple. So, uh, you know, when I say I have a goal for this and this and this, that's very simple, but I'm extracting it from maybe 1,000 combinations. So I can do that as my first agile step. My first agile step is simple. Maybe I have <coughs> ultimately 1,000 agile steps in the next 50 years. But uh, dealing with all those 1,000 steps for 50 years right now, that's called big bang waterfall thinking. Agile is about decomposing, about dividing up, about doing some simple things and getting them done, okay? So I can extract something simple. So the word extract translate to uh, find a valuable, um, simple value delivery step, call it sprint. And we can work on that and, and we can deliver some value improvements early for, for what? Well, for critical stakeholders and critical uh, things like uh, tracing COVID. And, and uh, now I call all of this agile as it should be. So there's an agile out there, which I'm not very happy with. Uh, read my uh, um, uh, value agile book, free. Okay? And I criticize the, in, in, in great depth, the, it's, it's, it's at the end of this uh, set of lecture slides. Uh, I, I criticize all the agile principles and, and um, uh, things systematically. I don't only really criticize them, but I suggest something better. I believe there's a thing called that agile as it should be, and I believe in simple terms, that's about delivering value systematically. Okay, and that's not what most agile people are doing. They're using agile for, in simple terms, delivering code, okay, which is fairly uninteresting, except if you're a coder, okay. Um, let's see, we'll leave that. Now, scales of measure, uh, we're using the Valplan uh, tool, okay, and uh, uh, so, uh, n n number one, uh, remember I mentioned that scales of measure are in the tool? Well, here they are. This is exactly the same as the set of scales of measure in my competitive engineering book, chapter five. And uh, uh, the tool is built so you can add any scales of measure you want that you learn about. Now, once they're there, uh, uh, you, you click on one of these, and it automatically puts in the template scale with scale parameters. Okay, so that's automatic electronic retrieval of known scales of measure. And then you can modify this any way you like. You could take away some parameters and words or add some, but you'll get a starting uh, point. And uh, one way of tailoring is that um, we have the word system here, but in your domain, there are five really important systems. And, some other purposes to domain, there are five other systems. So you can put in your types of systems that you have to look at, like the database, the, the internet you have, or whatever. Uh, you have different failure types. So you can tailor this, even though it's a generic high level scale, by putting in your failure types, your conditions, and your systems, okay? So I, what I'm trying to show with this slide is, number one, prototype scales with scale parameters are uh, available for free manually in the book and electronically in the tool. And you can put them in any tool you have and retrieve them any way you like. Okay. 
So that's the idea. But uh, so partly we're tailoring by having scales that apply to our uh, domin dominion, uh, domain, is the word I really want. And partly we're tailoring by taking Gilb's ideas of scales, thank you very much, but tailoring to our failure types, our type of systems, uh, et cetera. I'll show you more about how that works exactly in a moment, which is now. Okay, now, it turns out when, when uh, you copy this and press the button, I've got a scale, it says, aha, Tom, you have this scale parameter, this scale parameter, and this scale parameter, and that means you want to define what they are. So what it automatically does is it takes this conditions things and says conditions defined as and blank. And it takes systems defined as and then blank. And same with failure types. Now it's up to me to say, okay, my conditions are database recovery, logic fix, uh, component replacement. And my failure types are power failure, sabotage, component fault. And my system types are database central hardware, internet application software, and OS software. Okay? So I have now modeled, this is modeling, my world, not Tom Gill's world, not from his book, based on a template, a generic template, which says, invites me, if you like, to say, what are my stuff here? Okay. Now, by the way, you, you notice this little arrow here? That arrow, when you press it, captures this domain definition in a glossary. So the next time I use that keyword spelled exactly that way, I automatically get that definition for my domain. So this is a corporate learning mechanism. If you think this might be, it's not one off, it might be reusable in the health system and other health systems, you put it in glossaries and the digitized computer will automatically know that this particular word spelled exactly this way has one and only one meaning, the one in the glossary. And if you don't like that, you better spell this word a different way because that's what it's going to do. Okay. So you're, you're looking at uh, very powerful ideas for uh, corporate learning. Okay. And a lot of top managers and CTOs are very interested in that. You know, how do we learn the lesson and accumulate them and share them with people? And here you're sharing with Tom Gilb's ideas, but you can add your ideas and have a, of, of a prototype template scales of measure. And then uh, here you are modeling your local culture and deciding, I mean, one click and it's in the corporate database to put, make a, uh, actually we have two levels here, uh, project level and corporate level, but let's not go there um, right away. Okay, so ways of sa saving the information and making it available to everybody. Did you get that? Big ideas on practical uh, uh, corporate learning. I mean, everybody gives the talk, you know, we should do corporate learning. I'm telling you specific methods for actually doing it in practice, which is different. Okay. Now, uh, I, I briefly mentioned something about top 10 critical objectives, but I didn't say a lot about it. So I have a concept which says that at any level of say, let's say the project, take a level. Now at the level of project, I believe there are uh, a few really critical values and um, from one to a hundred probably. And I believe it is useful to draw a line at approximately 10, top 10, okay? Uh, not because 11 is wrong or nine is wrong, but it's a nice round number. And God actually gave us 10 fingers hinting that 10 was a pretty good number. That's my sincere belief about God, okay? So I like top 10 values. And uh, uh, so what I ask people to do on the first morning of the first day of any project, I say, let's brainstorm as a group your top 10 values, just by name, names like these. And so they brainstorm. And by the time an hour or two has gone by, they've got 15 or 20. And I say, okay, but uh, give me, you know, uh, dump or de deprioritize some of them. I want the probably most important 10. And that's, say, these. Okay. Now, what I do with these is, this is a way of focusing energy on critical things. That is, if you allow yourself to take absolutely all requirements that all stakeholders might have, you probably have 500 to 5,000, and you will drown, and you won't get anything done. By 
by, by consciously saying we declare arbitrarily, subjectively, but maybe wrongly, these to be the top 10, you have simplified your task. You're no longer looking at 500. And you have prioritized the top 10. You've prioritized these. What does that mean? It means, in principle, we're going to deliver these values first, and then we'll take a look at the next 10. Got it? So that gives you a prioritization sequence, too. It's not that we're not going to do the other things. We're just going to decide to prioritize a certain set. Now, what I've found is any executive group I work with, they can and will brainstorm 15 or 20 values in an hour. They can and will decide on the top 10. <clears throat> and they will agree, for the sake of argument, that we should focus on these and wouldn't it be great if we could deliver these values. These same people have projects attacking things like this that have gone on for five years and delivered not one single value improvement at all. Total failure. Okay, so the idea that maybe 10 of these would actually deliver all their goals in a year or two using Agile, that's a very, very nice idea. These are, by the way, uh, one of the courses. Uh, so here's help, help me manage. London, we chose London congestion for air quality. So that's what these are doing. Uh, here is a, uh, what I call a, a specification object. And uh, it is a requirement specification object. Um, to be uh, very concrete, it is a type value objective or value requirement. Okay. At the level, we have levels here, I won't get too long into that, of a stakeholder. And it has a tag, air quality. Okay. Uh, this air quality is part of the top values. In fact, see air quality. It's part of top value. So this, this is actually generated automatically from the digital information that we've stored in the, uh, the, the object here. But it also keeps track and reminds us there are uh, uh, different you know, levels here that we're looking at. If I click on that top values, I automatically go back to the top level and see all the different values. So navigation, these hot links give me very fast navigation around the model for all values and, and, and everything like that. Now here's our friend, the ambition level, drastically improved air quality in London. Uh, I've given it a tag. I can tag almost everything, like AQ stands for air quality. But um, if, if you have multiple, for example, uh, here are three, uh, two different goals I could, and, and two different tolerables, uh, I could put tags on these to quickly distinguish between them, give them an, a, a unique identity. There's only one, you don't need to, but if there are two or more, you might like to. Anyway, I chose to give a tag to that. For example, let's say there are three competing stakeholders that each have their ambition level, then I could give a tag to each one to identify uh, which stakeholder. By the way, this is what we call a one-liner format. There it is, one line. That is, this idea of ambition level is collapsed to one line. Scale is collapsed to one line. Meter is collapsed to one line. But in, in reality, if I click on these, it opens up to a window of approximately a full page or 10 lines. We'll see that. We saw, uh, by the way, uh, this is a scale window enlarged. Okay, so this one line or scale opens up to go into detail. We'll see more of that as we go along. But it's very convenient to automatically collapse things to one liners. It gives a quick overview actually of detail of the uh, project. So there's the scale uh, collapsed into one liner, but if I want the detail, for example, what are all the types of persons, what are all the types of pollution, I just click on that once and it opens up to the kind of window you saw a moment ago. Meter, now there can, uh, again, uh, there's only one scale for a, a, a named uh, quality, uh, but there can be many different meters, like a short-term development meter, uh, a contractually valid necessary legal meter and a full payment meter and things like that, or even scientific research meters. So you can have many meters here, but uh, this, is, this is a high level design. It basically outlines roughly how we're going to measure along that scale. And it should have enough detail that you say, we can do that. We can afford to do that. 
and it will have accuracy enough for purpose. That's all you're doing with the meter. But this is test planning at a very high level. Okay. Here's our status, um, and it says you know when ex exactly and and for what. Uh, here are two tolerable levels. This is this minimum. Here are the goal levels. These are acknowledged uh, what the project has promised to do. Uh, here is a stretch level, which is I haven't talked about. It's a target. Uh, it was really invented by my friends at Nokia, who plan that way. They and athletes too. They think of you know beating, beating the world record if you've got time and an extra jump. And so uh, stretch is what you do if you've got resources available, but you've achieved all your goals. So that's what stretch is. This is a way of being very competitive. And that's why my book is called Competitive Engineering. We do things that help people compete. Okay. Here's the stakeholders list. Two mayors of London, not to worry. And here's some more information. It's, it's an assumption. This is an example of background information. In fact, there's quite a lot of background information here. Stakeholders is background. Assumption is background. Status is background. Um, meter is background. Ambition level is background. The tag is background. Value is background. So uh, a background means uh, something in addition to the core requirement. The core requirement is the scale and a tolerable and or a goal and or a goal and or a stretch. Okay. In other words, the things, uh, the, uh, the uh, things we're really going to do in the future, that is the core quantified requirement. But there's quite a lot of stuff we put into a requirement. And I wouldn't put it in if it were just bureaucracy and extra stuff. I put it in because it helps me decompose and prioritize, manage risk, and deliver greater value. And those are all big, important things that are well worth a few extra lines in a requirement. Most people have a one line requirement. Uh, think your user story or use case or functional requirement. These are generally speaking one line and they tend not to contain most all of this information. And so, the, and I, would, I wouldn't justify this if it didn't, uh, there wasn't an argument and a practice and many people practicing who believe in it, who thinks that this gives tremendous value in, in relation to the trivial cost of writing one line or something like that. So I'm arguing that the specification object should be much larger, uh, have 10 or 20 uh, uh, parameters, we call these, okay, specification items. And this enriches our knowledge uh, of the specification object. And the, this knowledge can be used for artificial intelligence, automation, art, uh, automatic prioritization, risk management, automatic reviews and quality control, presentation purposes at different levels, and uh, masses of other things. So there's like no doubt for the people who know what's going on here that this is worth it and very much for them. So this is a whole new way of doing requirements and automating requirements uh, to move into the new world. I mean, most people are in a 1960s way of specifying requirements to put a name on it. It's certainly not 21st century. Intel in teaching my methods calls it uh, uh, 21st century methods, by the way. Okay. Um, now, here is uh, the same thing. Uh, I didn't mention this. This is automatic summary on one line of all the different levels of, of uh, benchmarks and constraints. And uh, um, uh, that's a benchmark trend that I haven't talked about. Benchmark, benchmark, target, 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 constraint. And uh, we've uh, clicked on the status so we get all the detail of all the parameters for the status that's, uh, 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 you know, including usually even the delivery date. It's not there for the moment. But uh, so this is like a graphical summary of all the different levels on a one liner. It's totally automatic. It's, it's uh, derived automatically from all of this. But anyway, here's the scale which we've clicked and opened on. And, uh, and here, as I showed you before, really, here is the person scale parameter. And then here is the person scale parameter defined. I can see what the options are. And here is the pollution parameter defined. I can see what the options are. Okay, beginning to absorb that. 
Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Okay. Benchmark. Okay. Now I've mentioned benchmark and I started by showing you the status benchmark. And I said status has a lot to do with agile because this is the current rolling incremental status of that value. So in, in agile terms, it's what we measured at the end of the last sprint. Okay. A lot of sprints don't really measure, they ascertain the uh, user story works or the use case works or something like that, or the function works, and it doesn't have any known bugs. Uh, but uh, they don't uh, normally say we're going to measure the value delivered. That's uh, uh, not the language of Scrum or, or, or anything else to my knowledge. But it should be. It should be the norm. Okay? Agile should be delivering value primarily and measuring value at absolutely every, every step. Okay, so we have a set of things we call benchmarking, and you know the word, I'm sure, but it, it, it simply means, uh, it means systems analysis, okay, there's the word. It certainly is the business analyst who should primarily be doing this, but marketing people and other people might in fact be doing some of it. It's certainly not the work of the architect or the programmer or the project manager or the CEO. Okay, it, it is systems analysis and we have a position called business analyst uh, who maybe provides requirements and, and they're supposed to analyze this stuff. Okay, so there are lots of different types of um, uh, benchmarks. We looked at some. Now the purpose of benchmarks is several, but they're, they're so that we understand where we were, where we are, or where we might be or where anybody else was, is, or might be like a competitor or an enemy. In other words, with reference to the real world, okay? It's simply real world measurements that are interesting in connection with this value. Have you got the basic idea, okay? Now, um, uh, here, here's uh, past as a benchmark, okay? Uh, so past is uh, static. In other words, there is uh, th this past just uh, was, which was in 2016 for these parameters is at the level of 135 and that's it. That's an observation that was made. It's not going to change for any agile steps you do. Uh, in Greater London in 2016, it's not affected at all by anything you do in 2020, 2021. So if you like, it's a historical fact. Got it? It's an observation. Uh, but it's a, a, a benchmark. Now, notice the status is something different. That's updated every sprint, or at least every time you make an observation. Okay. Now, uh, the, um, the, here's the past. Now, here's the wish level. We want to reduce the uh, pollution from 135, blah, 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 uh, nitrogen dioxide, to 67. Okay. So here it is. Uh, in the past, we had 135, and we want 67. So here we have two points on a scale. Now, what do we want? We want the air quality to get better. That's, uh, a, a, as a mayor of London, I want the air quality to get better because that'll get me reelected. That's a user story. Now, here's another way of saying I want the air quality to get better. Here is a scale of measure of air quality, you know, uh, micrograms per, yes, uh, cubic meter for defined pollutant. This sounds good. And uh, uh, okay. And uh, here's an observation of exactly how bad it is when we did this, that's the data we had. And here is getting better. Okay. So, so here's, here's the thing. All these words like enhanced, increased, better can, joke coming up, better be defined by two points on a scale. Got it? So by moving between 135 and 67, I'm getting better, okay? And I'm, it's very, the uh, concept of getting better, uh, a vast, here it says vast improvement, right? Well, what does vast improvement mean? Well, it could be going from 135 to 0 0.1. That would be a vast improvement, but somebody thinks vast improvement in practice means 67. Well, thank God, because I would have thought it meant one or less vast or 10, but it means twice as good. I, I wouldn't call that a vast improvement. I'd, I'd call it a good improvement, but you know, very ambiguous word, vast. But now we've pinned down exactly what it means. 
for exactly 2021 for nitrogen dioxide in London as a measured thing. Okay, so uh, make a long story short. Uh, the benchmarks are useful to give us clear definition of all of these bullshit words like enhanced, improved, and vast. Whenever you hear those words, you need to react and say, what is the scale? What is the starting point, the benchmark? And what is the future date we want? Yeah. Now, by the way, I wrote another book you can have for free this summer, and it's called Plan Analysis. Look it up in the references. But this is how to analyze bullshit statements like the ambition level. And there are, I teach some of these tricks. When you see, say the, see the word vast, enhanced, improved, think scale of measure, benchmark, and target. And now we have a precise definition that can be con communicated to anybody and everybody, and it's very difficult to misunderstand this. I'm sure somebody can do that, but it's difficult. Okay, this vast improvement is very easy for everybody to always, 99 times out of 100, to guess wrongly. I mean, how many people are gonna guess 67 in 2021 for nitrogen dioxide. It doesn't even say nitrogen dioxide, it just says air quality. So there's three variables you've got to guess correctly. Well, if you can do that, you ought to win money on the pools or the, play, the lottery because you can guess all the magic numbers. Nobody can do that. Um, okay, let's see. Yep, and next, okay. Now, here's another benchmark called the record. And there's the record example, okay? Now, uh, think Guinness Book of Records, think Olympic record, think world record, what's that? Well, that's the best in the world or in Europe or in your country, national record, uh, for something like running 400 meters or jumping a high jump or whatever. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the record concept is, it just simply means the best, nobody beat it, which is comparable with. Now, uh, the record is a very nice benchmark for several reasons. Number one, if you can state the record, it proves you have some knowledge of the domain. Put it another way, if you cannot specify the record, you don't have an expert in this domain amongst you and you're treading on very dangerous territory. Like if you're dealing with air pollution and you don't know how bad or good it ever got, then you're just mucking about with funny numbers. As this, the um, sign of an expert, my definition of an expert is they know the records numerically. You think about that for a moment. Sign of people who are not expert is they do not know the records numerically. Okay, so that's point one. Uh, point two, everybody knows that it's difficult to beat the record. Not impossible, but records can stand for 20 or 30 years and nobody can beat them, right? So it's difficult. So what if you have a goal to jump five meters high, but the world record is 3.9? Do you think I am going to jump five meters high? Let's say I'm Donald Trump. I'm going to jump five meters high. You better believe me, I'm Donald Trump. I never get it wrong. But the world record is 3.7, okay? So the record is a little test. If you have planned to be better than the record, you actually have identified a very high risk that you will fail, okay? So maybe we need to be a little bit humble. Yes, we are trying to break the record. Yes, we think it will take five years and five billion, but you know what? We could easily be wrong. Nobody has ever beat that record. Therefore, there is no knowledge of what it costs, when it can be done, and if there is any technology to do it at all. So there's a risk that we will totally fail to find the vaccine before the November 3rd election. 
<laughs> no matter how much Donald Trump wishes it could be found. Okay. So there are certain records for how fast a vaccine is made ready safely. And every, all the scientists know what they are, even if Trump ignores them. Okay, so uh, rec putting in the record is kind of a discipline. It, it, it invites us to decent systems analysis about what is really possible. And by the way, it does another thing. If you know the record, you can ask, how did they set the record? That gives you some architecture, that gives you a design or strategy which is used to set the record. And you say, if I use that same strategy, I have a fair chance of getting the record. If I use another strategy, I'm not sure. Uh, but maybe I have to use another strategy which was not used, which is better to beat the record. In other words, there's some reasoning around architecture that happens when you know the record and you know what you're planning to do with the wish levels. Okay. So long story short, record is a very useful, um, not obligatory, but it's a very useful way of thinking about state of the art. In other words, military, space, medical systems, and anywhere where we're really pushing the state of the art, uh, finding the new vaccine in such a short time, it's absolutely pushing the state of the art, uh, getting um, virus tracking apps running, absolutely pushing the state of the art. And uh, for example, you know the record for getting a medical tracing app to work was say one year just to put a name on it, then trying to do it in three weeks is, is uh, really pushing your luck and it didn't work, did it? That kind of thing. Okay, next, the trend. Now this is a benchmark and trend is looking into the future. It's saying the way things are going, we will get worse and worse and worse or the way things are going on this scale of measure, the competitor will get better and better and better. And the point is when you set goals for a project that will be done in three years, you can't beat the competitor's level today. You have to beat the competitor's level in three years, okay? You can't assume that you will be as good as you are today in three years. <coughs> Your system may be degenerating from technical debt and it might be 10 times worse. And you have to deal with that fact. So again, trend is a, a, a way of doing systems analysis. It's the kind of thing marketing people do all the time. So these, those are the ones to do it. You know, how is our competitor doing? What's happening with our products? Are they getting old and long in the tooth? But plugging the trend information into the requirement definition gives you all kinds of interesting things. For example, are we planning with our goal to be better than the competitor will be. If not, you're a loser, your project's a loser, and you're wasting your time and money. Okay, this is the kind of thing that might get the attention of a very enlightened top executive or marketing executive. Ways of thinking about marketing and competition. Programmers couldn't care less about this stuff, but top executives understand it right away, care a lot, and like a better way of doing it. That's what they do. Part five, uh, we're gonna, uh, I've actually got a little thing in front of my screen. Can I move that around? I can't move it. It just insists on being there. Stop sharing. Oh dear, I pushed stop sharing. This is not a good idea. Uh, and I need to get somebody gonna help me get sharing again. <laughs> Let's see. Should you have a button? on the yeah, bottom the button. of the screen. Okay, button, bottom of the screen. Okay, now I don't see which screen, right? Many screens, advanced, space, audio, video. Just to check. Uh, share screen. Did you find it? Yeah, okay, I got share screen. Uh, uh, there's a little thingy down here. It's probably- The window screen. is called the uh, Zoom meeting and if you scroll your mouse down, uh, the, it should appear at the task uh, bar, like a second menu. Zoom meeting, okay. Yeah, you, maybe you can't see. I've got a thing called share screen here. I have a button at the bottom I can't see because I've maximized the size of my screen. I think I'm going to go to a lower resolution screen so I'm sure I see everything. Excuse me a so moment. Please check. I should absolutely not press stop. Here. There we go. And displays 
and uh, something like that. There we go. Now I can see all the settings. Okay. And advanced share screen. <laughs> uh, share selected, uh, limit your screen sharing to 10 frames per second. Show screen where share selected app window only. Okay. And now what else do I press? Seems you have open settings, but not screen sharing. Machine. Okay, so I'm, I'm in Keynote. Do I, I have, oh, wait a minute. There's something down here. Ah, I see it was hidden by other windows. Share screen. Great. We're back, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, desktop, Keynote. Uh, yeah, we see. You got my screen back? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. I was, <laughs> I was trying to move a little thing away and it, it said it had, I pressed the stop share button inadvertently. Okay. We should move around. Okay, anyway, fine. Trend. Okay, so trend is a point on the scale that enables us to think about the future, us and them. It's a way of modeling the future. It's a way of integrating information from marketing and CTO uh, competitive analysis into your agile project. Let me put it another way. I mentioned that I've noticed every top executive team I work with keeps on talking about aligning IT with the rest of the organization. And it's a big, well-known problem that IT is infamous and architecture is infamous for being bad at aligning with the organization. This is alignment with the organization. Trend, past, record. Uh, and, and in fact, all the other things. It's a, a definitely a way of aligning with your, I've argued this point in the architecture book at great length, that these methods are very specific practical tools for aligning IT with the rest of the organization. Okay, so here we are. Um, I'm trying to move a window around. Okay, so we're gonna look at uh, a set of things on the scale called constraints. Now, keeping it real simple to begin with, there's one scalar, meaning on a scale constraint, which is most used. <laughs> and you could just start by using it, not worry about <coughs> the other ones. Give me a bit. And it's the tolerable idea. So tolerable is, is, is uh, the minimum viable level. Everybody knows about minimum viable products in lean startups and things like that. That's the minimum viable level. Below it, you are not viable. You die. Okay. So, uh, but, so clearly it's a constraint, but since it's on a scale, it's a scalar constraint. If you just say, the product must be made in Lithuania. That's a binary constraint. It's not a scalar constraint. It's a constraint. There are all types of constraints. Uh, now, at this point, tolerable, we have a range which says below this level, things are intolerable. In other words, failed value, which usually means, since it's a critical value, failed entire system. Okay? If everything in your body is perfect, but your heart stops. Only one thing stops, but everything stops. You're dead. So critical factors, which is what we're managing, those are the top 10 critical factors. If one of them is below tolerable limit, then generally speaking, you're dead. The whole project is you're not allowed to implement it, use it, or it's illegal or something like that. Now, above tolerable limit and above is a range, better and better and better and better, uh, called we're tolerable, we're okay. Until you reach a level called the goal level, that's the one we're planning to deliver. Now, the moment you hit the goal level, you're into a territory or range called success, okay? And you can get better and better and better, you're still success, success, success. So we, here's the concept of ranges, number one. Here's the concept of points that define the ranges. And what do we use all this for? Well. Lots of things, but uh, priority, let's talk about prioritization. We need to prioritize 
the use of our people, time, and money for the project so that we achieve all the tolerable levels. If not, we have a dead system. There's no point in using your time and resources to move towards a goal level or something else when you have a, an intolerable value that makes your whole system dead, okay? You're, you're just uh, optimizing something which is not allowed to exist because you have a dead system. In other words, if your heart is stopped, it doesn't help to optimize your brain, put it that way, <laughs> something like that. Okay, um, okay so, so we use the tolerable limits, there's a set of 10 for the critical, top 10 critical things, to manage the prioritization of our resources in the early stages of agile delivery of value. This is an agile method. Then when all 10 hit the tolerable limit, we are free to uh, let uh, the values use our resources to let the values move towards the goal level. Now the moment one of them hits the goal level, stop using resources, value goal is satisfied, use your resources for the other values that aren't yet at the goal. When all goal levels are satisfied, stop using resources. Hand them back, money, time, people, whatever, okay? Now, of course, we might have multiple goals, which makes the picture a little bit uh, more complex, but I have a simplified model here that we have, you know, 10 goals for 10 critical factors. And when you have reached those 10, you are officially done. You officially have success. And if you started using your resources for making it better and better and better, somebody should rightly come to you and said, hey, nobody asked you to do that. We have other uses for the budget and the people uh, where we have other projects that are not reached success, not even reached their uh, tolerable level. So we need to take your resources and use them elsewhere. This is a way of managing a portfolio or program of projects in case you didn't. Notice these techniques can be used for that. Okay, let's see. Right, uh, here's another way of uh, looking at the, uh, for the same thing that, uh, you know, this territory is your first priority, getting to the tolerable level. This territory is your second priority, getting to the goal level. And your third overall priority is being better than successful, going towards stretch levels or other goals and things like that. Um, okay, the concept we're trying to get across here is uh, multiple levels. Now here's a multiple. Here's a tolerable for 29th, with a, a date, a deadline, 29th of September, 2021. Here is another tolerable level for 29th of September 2020. Oh, that's soon. So this is near term. This is somewhat longer term. Okay. So uh, I'll make several points. All of these points on a scale, you can have as many of them as you want, as many as they're useful. There's no such thing as only one of them. Okay. You may have none. You don't have to have a tolerable level, uh, but uh, and you can have one and you can have two and you can have 25. Okay. Now, what's the difference? Well, here's one difference. Uh, basically, what we're doing here is we're drawing a curve, time curve, uh, where this is the short-term tolerable, and then it gets even better in the long term. So five down to one. We recently improved the software in Valplan to automatically draw <coughs> the curve for all these things. So you see it very visually. But here it is digitally. Uh, okay, so uh, in, in other words, uh, we can uh, satisfy the need for short-term planning, like before the election, and long-term planning, if I get elected, kind of thing. Uh, and, and there's always a need for both short-term and long-term, and you can specify very precisely how that curve runs, how that looks. Uh, that was our break at 10 minutes to uh, the hour. Uh, let's see, are we more or less done with that? Yeah, so uh, the ability to have multiple levels enriches our planning ability, short term, long term, uh, even uh, different parameters and conditions like this kind of stakeholder and that kind of stakeholder. 
and our control over different things and our prioritization over critical things. So, and, and it, it literally gives us um, data in the digital system to permit automatic prioritization. We'll see that later, totally automatic. With that, 10 minute break and uh, see you in 10 minutes. I'm gonna go away for a short break and then I'll be back and maybe answer some questions. To the projects, what kind of the environment, what kind of the knowledge of the people and the, and the staff in the companies and in the projects, are all those methods really fit very well? So you yeah. can re recommend this, understand, for example, a big project, implementation no. project, like the ERP system. Oh. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, have you been have you been with me from the beginning of the talk today? Yes. Okay. Now, I, I I believe I said something to answer your question. For example, small programming, no, too much. I mean, if you if you're going to build the dog's house, you do not need an architecture and an engineering company, right? So right. Uh, what I said was, it's larger projects like uh, national health system for Lithuania. Right? As a non trivial, yeah. non, it's not a few guys hacking some code for a few weeks. Okay? I, I suspect that much of the agile we know was designed in environments, in fact, it's actually very well known, like the Chrysler Corporation example from the early agilistas. It was just one small project kind of thing with a few people. So, uh, okay. So, so uh, now I'm, I'm, I'm selling you. As best I can, not with, for money, but for love. <laughs> I'm selling you engineering methods. So let's uh, we can ask a simple question: When does society use engineering methods for buildings, for airplanes, for anything? And the answer is when it gets large, complex, life critical. You know, and there's a lot of projects like that, and they consume a lot of resources, like. You know, half of the national resources of Norway are probably going to projects like that right now. Uh, you, you need a clearer, better way of thinking about complex systems. A complex means hundreds of stakeholders, a few hundred critical values, all kinds of cost aspects, uh, technology, you know, a million options in the air, nobody knows. This is complex, okay? But uh, our, a typical large IT project has all these characteristics. So we can start with the largest IT projects for sure. And then we work our way down to a level where these things are over the top. We just let this smart guy code and be done. Okay. We are in fact using these methods for very small projects. Okay. Uh, so I gave the example of Lou Watt building the toilet for Africa. It's only four people we talked with. Uh, I, 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 uh, I've got a lot of, a lot of the startups we do are really small, though they may become large, okay? They are aiming for world dominance, every, every startup, but they are small. Uh, and the, the other example was the life design I mentioned. The life design is designing your life or a part of it. That's pretty small team, you, you know, for maybe just 10 years ahead or five years ahead. That's pretty small. But I have a whole book called Life Design and I have decades of experience that doing that helps people think better and straighten out their life, literally get a whole different, better life. Am I beginning to answer your question? Yes, you started to answer the question because as I understand the complexity of the, of the domain can be just the one aspect uh, that you should take into account. But of course, there are a few others. Like for example, uh, if I am doing the project in the industry or in the public uh, sector, because there are the other people, the other knowledge, uh, the approach to the business is completely different. So then yeah. uh, I would expect that beside this uh, complexity of the, of the domain, using this method before using your approach we should take into account a few other a few other aspects like for example as i said if you are in the business or maybe it's let's call it a high tech 
or maybe I am in a pharmaceutical with a special regulation or I am in a construction industry because uh, behind this are the uh, specific knowledge, the specific approach of the people yeah, and their experience because it would be great when, for example, I am now implementing the a manufacturing execution system in one of the pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies in Poland. Okay, so it's really, really, really a complex project. And uh, I would say that all you have presented us fits very well to that the problem. But then comes the question of the knowledge and experience of the people. And if they have no experience with all these objectives, uh, with the measures, so then, well, even if it fits uh, from the point of view of the complexity, I, yeah. I Judge, would Judge, be afraid Judge, to implement it. Uh, stop, stop, stop. Uh, remember, yeah, yeah. we are starting two minutes ago, everybody. So you yeah, and I okay. have to continue this conversation another time, which we can. Okay. Uh, let, let me it give a short, short answer. You, you raised the following question. What if the people who should do this are incompetent, they're not trained, they're not educated, they don't like numbers, okay? Well, uh, then you will probably fail to do this until you either train them or get people who are trained. It's the same with any engineering discipline. If I have a good carpenter and I suddenly say, sorry, we're gonna do a 200 story skyscraper this year, please start designing, he's got no hope, he's not trained, you know? Uh, it's out of scope, okay. So, uh, yeah, so we can discuss it, but I'll tell you what, um, yeah, even the next break we can discuss. But uh, okay. remember, the break is the 10 minute interval, and then yeah. we're going to okay. continue. The, yeah. Right, right. You, you know so, how to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let's switch to your lecture. Thank I, you very much. I, Warsaw. Many good memories from Warsaw. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the. Uh, uh, there we go. Last active speaker. Let's just see. Okay, so resume. Um, Multiple levels, yeah. So the, just to pick up where we were, we can use multiple um, of these parameters, like two tolerables, three tolerables, three, to express uh, time and space ideas. Space is the scale parameters. Each one scale parameter is a whole dimension unto itself. And uh, so, for example, if you have six scale parameters, you have six dimensions of freedom plus time like the deadline uh so so you actually uh, in other words let's call it seven dimensional thinking that's to get you thinking this is very powerful in complex systems to operate in any useful dimensions long story short okay now part six targets so uh i've already mentioned the wish the goal and the stretch a target level is defined as planning to achieve in the future. And a wish is defined as stakeholders need or wish, perfectly good word. Goal is project committed goal. You can rely on it. And stretch is maybe if we have time and money and other resources and have achieved all the goals, our project can move towards the stretch levels without getting special permission from the steering committee or something like that. Uh, every one of these can have different deadlines, different time. Uh, basically, you can draw a curve of, of uh, the, the wishes through time, the goals through time, stretches through time, and different conditions, like six different conditions. Okay. Um, okay, enough of that. Um, Let's see. Okay. Now, uh, here, here's the, the pitch here. Clear targets begin with clear scales. In other words, uh, you, this art of getting a really clear scale idea uh, means that when we say wish is five or goal is five, it has a deep, clear, well-defined meaning. Now, if, if you look at this ambition level, I want the best security to fight hackers and protect my customers and company. That is not clear. If you have a user story, as the user, I want good security to fight bad guys. 
um, that it still is not clear. It, here's the problem. These are what I call unacceptable statements for clarity of purpose. They are acceptable at the top in the ambition level as a way of saying, this is what our client really said. And we did not change what they said. We interpreted it more clearly and may or may not have gotten their permission to do so. That's another matter. So the, these are worthless in the long term, but they're not worth, they're a good starting point in the short term. And that's what you're going to get from the documentation, from the people, are these short phrases with uh, extremely high ambiguity. And uh, for the large scale, you know, saving the world projects or COVID-19, they are dangerous, worthless, and should be illegal ways of doing things. Yep. So there are no defined scales here. There are no definitions of, for example, uh, what types of bad guys do we have? There are no conditions, uh, and none of these are defined in, in terms of scale parameters. And there are no levels of benchmarks, constraints, and targets. They're just uh, implied, I want to get better. That's almost like one level sometime. No dates. Okay. So here's a simple analysis. You can find much more of this in the plan analysis book I referred to. Uh, this is what you're going to get and what you get through the whole world overall, 98% of all so-called requirements, okay? And uh, there is just totally missing everything needed to make it clear, to describe a real complex system, and to prioritize certain elements that need to be dealt with first. The wish target. Now, I've already said what I need to say, but uh, here's more detail about it. But uh, wish means the project has not decided to do it. The project cannot decide to do it until they know it is doable. Well, what does that mean? Well, doable means, one, we have the time, we have the budget, we have the people, we have the technology, and <coughs> nothing else has higher priority. <laughs> There's a whole lot of conditions to fulfill. When you've fulfilled all those conditions, you can do it and you can change the wish to goal. Because goal, coming up, goal means is no longer just the wish, but it is the commitment of the project to deliver that. And we are saying, we believe we have the budget, we believe we have the time, we believe we have the skilled people, we believe we have the technology, and we believe that nothing else will bump it in priority. Therefore, you can expect it to be done. A Little bit more wish, here is a wish level of going to 42 by, uh, let's see, this date. And the, uh, uh, when we open the wish window, it knows, it remembers, because it's a digital system, that security parameter had a whole bunch of options. And actually, if you press this, I could maybe go to a live system, but I don't, I don't dare for the moment. <laughs> uh, uh, it, you get all the options, and you pick, in this case, we picked attack, attempt, detected. And then attackers, you, we pick evil people. Uh, uh, by the way, you can pick uh, 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 none, all, one, to any set of these that interests you. Okay, here's a set of two take control, attacks or take control of the system and steal money, for example. Uh, when I train people to do this and get them to click the first time on security results, I tell them, of all the things on that list, pick the most critical thing to do. So this is hopefully they pick something really critical. And I say, now, of all the types of attackers you'd like to deal with, what is the most critical one to deal with early? Hopefully it's evil people. Of all the types of attacks to deal with, oh, take control of the system, steal money, both of them. Okay, fine. Now, what happens if they are choosing for this wish, for this date? Critical, 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 critical. Well, in fact, they have decomposed a value to a very, very critical 
thing to do, but a very, very relatively small thing to do. It may be 1%, one percent, one one hundredth of all the other combinations you're going to do later, but it may be the most critical one percent. Now, ask any manager you like, would you like to have the most critical one percent done this week or everything may be done in three years or maybe six years or maybe not at all? It's kind of a mafia choice. I've got to say, well, for uh, what, what if we don't do the critical 1%? Oh, all the managers will die. <laughs> oh, we'll take that one next week. I'm not going to wait six years and, and see it fail. Okay, This is agile. This is a very strong technique for decomposing into agile delivery steps or evolutionary evo value delivery steps we're talking about. Do you, you know, the, uh, the Agile, you know, doesn't have anything remotely like this, nowhere near. Doesn't even have a scale of measure for qualities, let alone scale parameters, let alone automation, let alone the um, ability to, to select these things and say, that's what we're gonna do next week. Um, okay, what's this slide doing? Yeah, okay. So here is a goal with nothing stated. And the reason is we've got the wish in there, but we uh, have not yet processed the wish. Now, I, I've already told you what processing the wish means. Basic, in sim simplest possible terms, it must be architected. It must be designed. What does that mean? It means we must find the thing we're going to do, deliver, integrate, so that, we reach the level 42. If we can find uh, something to do to reach 42, uh, then we have architected, but uh, we, uh, that thing uh, must satisfy a large number of uh, parameters. One, we have to be able to afford it at all. It, it cannot alone exceed our total budget, for example. Number two, we have to be able to afford that strategy, I often call it, <clears throat> together with all the other strategies we have to afford in the same project. So although it only costs 5% of the total budget, if we've already used up 99% of the budget, we only have 1% left and 5% is five times too much and we cannot do it and we cannot go for gold. Okay, uh, the, uh, there has to be finite technology to do this. It has to be something that guarantees to get us to 42 for this set of things, okay, et cetera. But long story short, it has to realistically be something where we can promise to get to 42 because we have the technology and the economics and the priorities. Then we literally click on the wish and change it to a goal. Everything remains the same. We're just changing from, we're looking at the problem for you. We acknowledge that you need 42, but we are not going to promise it until we feel confident that we will not be lying to you or sending you fake news uh, or anything like that. Okay, goal is serious commitment. Uh, here's an example of many goal statements, each with their own um, uh, uh, either uh, label or uh, 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 and and with different uh, uh, you know years and different combinations of things and things like that. So uh, again, this is drawing a curve in space and time. We're doing, and we literally now have the ability to use this data to draw those curves. Maybe a picture coming up on it. Um, let's see, many goal statement. Okay, so a stretch level. Uh, so here is a stretch level. And uh, stretch is pretty simple. Uh, you know, you're allowed to dream, you're allowed to dream outside the box to be very competitive uh, would be the primary reason. And, uh, but um, you, you, you have to also at the same time be a little bit practical because a stretch goal, we might not know how to do it. The technology to do it might not be even available until after the initial project has delivered its goals, might not exist. or the cost of the technology might be too high to use before we've delivered all the other goals. 
So we know it would be valuable to get us there. There would be some corporate value in getting to 38. But Stretch says we acknowledge that the stakeholder would find some value. Okay, that's, a, that's a great simple way of talking about it. We acknowledge stakeholder value at that level, but we do not promise to do it on this project. We have to get to a point where we satisfied the higher priority ideas, which are called goal, and we still have or can access resources. And then we can turn around and say, we have resources, we've done our goals, let's look at the stretch levels. And then a new round of architecture is necessary. Is there any technology to get there? What does it cost? Do we in fact still have the resources? And shall we convert the stretch to goal? Okay, got the idea stretch. Thank you, my friends at Nokia for teaching me the concept. They did very well for a while. So, meters, part seven. Now, here's a wonderful, uh, uh, let's see, gotta move this. John's weather forecasting stone. Okay, this is in Norway, but you'll find it on the internet. Okay, if the stone is wet, it's rain. The stone is dry, it's not rainy. If there's a shadow on the ground, it's sunny. If it's white on top, it's snowy. It's a wonderful weather predictor. If you can't see the stone, it must be foggy. If the stone is swinging, it's windy. If the stone's jumping up and down, there's an earthquake. And if the stone is gone, it must be a tornado. I think this is a lovely measuring uh, tool. But uh, that's what meters do. They, they do this shit. Okay, so uh, now here's, the, here's a meter. Now rule one, you must define the scale before you can define the meter. Okay, it's kind of silly to say I'm gonna use speedometer on the car but I haven't decided whether it's bits per second or volts. That's ridiculous, okay? You've got to know the scale and then you've got to design the scale so that it fits the, sorry, you've got to design the meter, sorry, so that it fits the scale. And you can have more than one meter. And uh, I, I use the time design a meter or engineer a meter because if you look a little bit more deeply into meters, they have a set of <coughs> quality attributes like accuracy, repeatability, credibility, availability, uh, and then they have a set of costs, like uh, capital costs, setup costs, operational costs, uh, down, uh, taking them down costs and things like that. So uh, choosing a meter is actually a multidimensional engineering problem. We usually just grab something that works, and if it's not too expensive and it's okay, we, we use it. But in um, things like a COVID system, to take a simple example, you would want to engineer your COVID measurement systems, the chaos in almost every country on how do we measure when we have limited resources is an example of somebody not thinking in advance, like uh, Harlem Brundtland at the WHO said yesterday, uh, you know, for 10 years she's been pleading and, uh, for people to design systems in advance and do them properly. And here we are trying to make it up on the fly so uh, by politicians making the decision, not engineers. Therefore, we're in chaos in the world, okay? But uh, so meters can and should be designed for serious purposes like uh, pandemics, okay? Put it mildly. And uh, meters are also culture that you can, you can you know, grow corporate culture, what they cost, how well they work, put them in, in uh, glossaries or uh, databases over different things with track record of how they work and grow corporate culture about meters that work for different classes of scales. Uh, here are some quality aspects of a meter, just to remind you. All of these are uh, quantifiable and I have quantified them uh, so that you can set up, you can set up a set of objectives for, uh, have a meter that meets a set of objectives for all these qualities. And you can, uh, here are the cost ideas and you can, uh, you can state your budgets for all of these. Say, I want a meter that also fits here. So you could be uh, engineering or designing or architecting a meter that fits uh, 12 different numeric criteria. If you're at the 
very sophisticated end of it, like uh, health systems for governments and things like that. You wouldn't do all of this for just testing a piece of code written by one person next week. That would be ridiculous, right? But it's not ridiculous when 3,000 people are dying every day because people haven't thought about these things. Then it's well worth somebody uses a day on this to save 3,000 lives. So here is uh, just an example of a meter, I think, same as I showed later. Now, uh, part nine is uh, making use of the value specifications in practice. And uh, now one thing I want to do before we're done, even though I seem to have a lot of time, is maybe make sure I have time for some essential ideas towards the end. That might mean going a little bit faster, skimming a little bit more, and not trying to be so thorough. I've been very thorough on a very important subject, which is the, the values but I don't feel I have to be that thorough on, on the other stuff. But uh, as I've already hinted at, uh, value requirement quantification can be used in contracting and proposals, okay? And maybe that's enough. If you're in the contract proposal idea and you realize you have not contracted for the value, the critical values at all, you're just paying time and materials to the sub supplier who's sucking you dry, uh, and we have had that situation now in, in Norway for the Axon project. PwC has been named and shamed as sucking millions out of the project and giving nothing. Okay, so you can't do worse than that. But that's what they're doing. Uh, if they had a, a contract saying health would get better in Norway, <laughs> measurably, and that's going to pay you, uh, that consultancy company might have done something more valuable for money. Okay, so enough said about that. Um, now, let's see. Uh, now we have the section on resource levels. Okay. So, uh, resource, but now most people, when they think of resources, just think of the capital cost budget or maybe just the deadline, forget the cost. Uh, when I say resources, I mean all scarce, limited resources money, time, people, space, credibility. Um, technical debt, you name it. Uh, but resources are things you need to make it work. They're tiger in the tank, they're fuel. They're not values that we want to achieve. They're simply stuff we have to have enough of to make things uh, come to life, initial, and to operate them, okay? So, uh, and looking at some of the architecture systems, for example, that we talked about earlier, I've been astounded to see that uh, some of them have absolutely no notion of costs whatsoever plugged into the method. Uh, at least nothing you can see, or they may be mumble costs, but they show you nothing and they do nothing. I believe that in, for every architectural idea, let's say there are 10 major architectural ideas, you need to look at the cost for three to six different cost aspects for every architectural idea you are suggesting. And that understanding the short-term capital cost, long-term operational cost, CapEx and OpEx, the banking managers call it, life cycle costs, decommissioning de costs. Uh, then uh, 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 Joe, Joe Biden has a great idea he just talked about in his town hall. He's going to pay thousands of people to go and cap the oil wells that people just abandoned in Pennsylvania so they have work to do. In other words, nobody worked out the decommissioning costs, so they're just there threatening the environment. And, and so the government's gonna end up paying for it. That's an example of somebody not required by law to look at the decommissioning costs and allowed to pollute the environment in terrible ways. <clears throat> okay, now th this is a list of uh, example of some costs. Here's the capital cost. There's a budget of this, and we start off at zero using the budget. Here's the uh, deadline. It's going to take a thousand days, about three years to do it. That's the budget. And uh, here's the initial status is, of course, at zero. Okay. And uh, here are the uh, full-time equivalents of staff we're allowed to have by budget or law or whatever. And here are the maintenance costs, like a, a million annually, for example. And these are just examples. But you've got to ask yourself, what kind of costs do we want to control, to know something about before we make decisions, before we prioritize things. I mean, obviously, 
you should be prioritizing the things that cost the least, right? Sound like a good idea? I mean, be stupid to say, we will not look at the cost at all, and we might end up picking something that costs a thousand times more than necessary, but who cares? We're using TOGAF, and we are enterprise architects, and we're not asked to do that. Okay, so I'll make a long story short. The architect, the enterprise architect, I refer you to my new book, C, S-E-A, is in charge of finding technology that costs a hell of a lot of money, billions, and takes a hell of a lot of time, years. And they must, and it should be by law, estimate costs and measure costs of all their architectural ideas. And they're nowhere near doing this. And what it, what it results in is projects that run way over deadline, way over budget. And people will want to say, oh, it's because it's complex IT technology. It's because the architecture doesn't, the architect doesn't know shit about cost estimation for architecture. And that's not good architecture, that's bad IT enterprise architecture. Good architects, like Frank Lloyd Wright, were also always extremely conscious of limited budgets and getting the most great architecture out of it. And we should emulate great architects like that and get the most value out of limited budgets. Everybody has limited budgets, not unlimited budgets. You have COVID killing 3,000 people a day. You don't have all the time in the world, okay? You're borrowing money in a country to finance COVID. You don't have all the money in the world. You need talented people to put together an IT system, and you don't have all the talented people in the world in a small country like Bahrain or something like that. And everybody, so you know, we've, we've got to um, uh, recognize what the Club of Rome called limits to growth. Uh, we have to recognize our limits explicitly, agree with the executives that those are the budgets for the moment. They can change. You can beg for more money. If you've got a good case for more value, but you, you should learn, people should, architects need to learn to leave within budgets and agile projects need to learn to measure the resources they're using at every step and learn to live within the budget. So I have an example coming up and it's in the documentation. IBM clean room method did this brilliantly they are doing Agile, 50 steps to deliver space military projects. Uh, they have an, their architect looks at the resource consumption. You know, we thought that it would take a week, it used four weeks. We thought it would take $100,000, it used $400,000. The architect, Robert Quinnen, steps in and says, I've got to find a cheaper, faster architecture, and I've got to do it right now for next step. And he does it and they try it out next step, and the next step only costs $10,000, it only takes a week, and then they scale up and they, they do this, but they have a track record for very large scale complex IT projects of for years on end, they're doing space shuttle software and things like, for years on end, they always delivered their software on time and under budget to the highest quality levels on the planet. That's my model for Agile as it should be. That's what uh, Evo does. But they were looking at their uh, resource budgets simultaneously with their qualities, like um, uh, availability of the plane, to take a simple example, or rocket. And uh, every step, which they were, had monthly steps for four years, 2% steps, I call them. Every step, the architect looked at the measures of value and resources and said, it's doing fine, take the next step, or it's not doing fine, I must intervene as architect. This is agile architecture. Not one big architecture, goodbye. It's architect involved in the building project, step by step looking at numbers and taking decisions to re-architect the system that's called design to cost in engineering terms or design to value to get better value from the technology. Uh, that's, uh, this is what Evo does. This is what my method does. But IBM Federal Systems Division, and I published this in 
1988 in my book, Principles of Software Engineering Management. That's great agile in practice. Not 95% of all projects, total failure or challenge, but zero projects failing at all for four years. That's the objective we should have for agile. The methods are right here, but you have to throw away these stupid architecture methods like Togaf and Zachman and on, and get some that in fact do what real architects do. They look at costs in a serious way. IT people don't bother. Okay, part eight, we're looking at risk management, prioritization and responsibility. Now, I've already talked to you about uh, background specifications. Uh, here's pretty close to the example, but I have some new things in there like an owner, assumption, issue, dependencies, where this pencil is in fact. Uh, I've added some. Now, uh, there, are, uh, there are about 20 to 40 possibilities of enriching a requirement or design specification with things like this, owner, assumption, issue, dependencies, risk, rationale. These are not the core specification. They are not the requirement itself. They're not the strategy or design itself, but they're things related to it. And related in what way? Uh, well, in, in, uh, first thing is they're there to help us prioritize, okay? Prioritization. They're there to help us manage risks, okay? And uh, they're, they're there to help us do quality control and reviews. And those are good enough reasons for investing in adding to any specification object a number of uh, specifications. Uh, owner. So these are like way outside of the three good things in a user story. So if we say there are three of these things in a user story, the stakeholder, the thing you're going to do, and the justification. I'm talking about adding about 20 more things to, to what we have in a user story. And you could literally, I suggest you add it to a user story. I mean, this, uh, 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 this is actually, uh, uh, where is the uh, issue, dependency, risk, ambition? There's the ambition level. So there's the nearest thing to the user story right down there. But there's all this other stuff in there, right? We're adding it because it's cost effective. It is justified. Experience tells senior people it's worth it. We're going to do it. We can do it. And by the way, another thing is by putting this here in a digital system, you have data which enables artificial intelligence to help you plan quality control plans, check for risks, and do automated prioritization. So it's not a matter of you put in the old days, we put this in and it made prioritization easier manually. Today, we're putting it into digitalized systems and we get totally automatic prioritization. Automatic product owner, not the old manual product owner for uh, Scrum, for example. Now, uh, here's a long list of why we put these things in. Let me do a few of them, okay? If you don't put, here, here's an assumption. We, during a meeting, we found an assumption that all this is based on the following assumption. Now, one person brought it up and nobody else knew about the assumption. And after the meeting, nobody can remember what the guy said. And the guy who said it is so good that he got a better job elsewhere and he left. So this information has disappeared. But you know what? If this assumption is not true, the whole project will fail. Okay? There's a famous uh, story about, uh, you know, for the, I lost my kingdom for want of a nail in the horseshoe of the king's horse. Uh, small things can can uh, ruin everything, or one nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day, as they say. So uh, I believe in collecting in writing and digitally um, uh, details that can kill your entire project if you don't deal with them. I don't believe that it's good enough that somebody has it in their head. I don't believe that it's good enough that they said it at a meeting. I don't believe that it's good enough it was said orally at all, face-to-face -face communication of Agile. I believe it must be written down and it must be put into a digital system so it's available to everybody throughout the world at all times. And one of the problems of Agile as we know it 
is it's based really on a non-digital uh, centralized small team culture. In other words, it's obsolete for large systems. And we've got to stop doing it. Uh, here's your next generation right here. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so that's the first one. If you, if you don't have a, a culture, I, I, I sit at meetings and I literally, somebody states an assumption without saying a thing, I write it down and I put it in the record. Okay, I make sure it gets done. There should be a person at a meeting whose job is to pick up little things and put them in the record, not in the minutes of the meeting, in the primary specification where it needs to be so people can use it. Got it? Not minutes of the meeting, not memory for people who weren't even at the meeting, who have left, in writing, integrated into the requirement specification. And once it's a digital specification and you've got all kinds of stuff to get rid of the noise you don't need and focus on things you do, this is, this is the best way to do it in, in short terms. Um, one other problem we have is that things might get discussed at early stages of a project and then decisions are made. And all this early thinking and decision making is effectively lost. It's in earlier documents that are not published by the National Health Service. Nobody even knows what the thinking was. I be believe in collecting early thinking uh, in writing and somehow hiding it, even if it's just a little parameter called early thinking you might not want to know anything about, but making it available digitally for anybody who does want to do the um, archaeology, the re review, you know, why the hell did this thing go wrong? Or why the hell is it going wrong? What was the early decision making? or even just review something and say, I want to understand this thing in terms of early decision-making and assumptions, okay? Um, now, uh, another thing is, it, it's not enough to have things in older documents. It has to be in your face. That means in the primary document, right up there when you list all the parameters, okay? Uh, there may be a problem either because of confidentiality or just it was uh, scribbled on in, in parchment and quill pens for retrieving from other documents at all or from human memory. It needs to be digital, means easily, cheaply available by at least central search techniques, not to mention uh, where we are building right now far more advanced artificial intelligent databases where everything here knows about everything else and uh, it figures it out or by artificial intelligence on its own. We're talking uh, Trinity, ontologies, uh, uh, level three web and things like that at uh, graph metrics. But we'll tell you when that's available. Um, another problem is uh, many people might know this stuff, but many people might not, not know it. And, but they might need to know it. So we need to put it where they can find it or bump into it if they need to. Okay. Now that's enough. I think these are a lot of very good reasons for taking the time and effort to do this. By the way, what does this cost? Well, you know, it takes about an hour of work for two people to do it. That's the cost. What's the cost of the failed uh, 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 COVID traceability app? You know, I mean, <laughs> it, uh, it was a hell of, it was a thousand times more than that because they didn't bother to capture things like uh, uh, assumption, nobody cares about GDPR. You know, that should have been there. And nobody was there to challenge it, even though they were making the assumption. Okay? So assumptions that are not true are some of the most dangerous stuff around. And risk handling, risk mitigation means you state your assumptions in writing. You make them available to any reviewer, any thinker, any analyst. And, and you, you even um, can do things like print out all the assumptions that don't have no mitigation or handling in the last year and do uh, mitigation work. Okay, enough of that. A lot, lot more could be said. I've said it here, but uh, you know, the background specification serves a very large number of valuable uh, purposes. Now, um, prioritization responsibility background statements. Now, here's a set of statements. It says authority, intended readership, owner responsible. So, <clears throat> uh, authority. Authority is a statement that says, who 
has the almost legal right to care about this or legal duty to do it, financial conduct would. Okay? Intended readership says, who do we need to be able to read and understand this specification? A trade union representative, a nurse, or do they all have to be computer experts? Okay, owner. This is the person or position that has the authority to change this specification. Nobody else is allowed to actually change this. They have to send all their suggestions to the specification owner, and the specification owner has a set of uh, governance, rules, standards for what they have to do to get things approved and get things changed properly. Okay, so this is change control. And notice the specification is, uh, of the owner is not at the level of the entire requirements or the entire design. It's at the level of the single requirement and the single design. And that has many interesting aspects, like if an owner owns 5,000 requirements, ah, they're going to lose track of it. If one guy who's the security chief owns the security requirement, they're going to know what they're doing and have time to do it properly and feel very personally responsible. So this is a matter of focusing responsibility to people who have the time and capability of really doing it rather than taking a formal responsibility, but everything goes wrong. Okay. Implementation instance is looking ahead to who is really going to do this. Is it PWC systems that now is in deep shit for the Axon medical system? Or is it yet undetermined sub-supplier by fair bidding and contracting, which they failed to do? Okay, uh, just, you know, uh, what we're doing is we're spelling out different classes of responsibility, uh, maybe getting, of course, approval for the set of things at some level of steering committee. Yes, these are approved for the moment, but we'll change them when we want to. Okay, so what we're doing is we're building the whole idea of responsibility and motivation and capability uh, into each specification. And I believe that this is necessary for handling complex systems in the long term. Uh, and maybe some of you see that, and uh, here's the tool. It's there. It's free. Okay. Uh, about 10 minutes to the, the break. So uh, now, uh, now I'm going to, in the analysis tools area, I'm going to move into the area of design. Okay. So uh, sometimes this is architecture, sometimes it's just uh, called design, and it's a, a level like security design is maybe a a one level below architecture. Now, in a way, it doesn't matter what you call it, whether you call it design or, or strategy or architecture or top management planning. If you are looking for the means, the practical way to get your values <coughs> within your costs and constraints, then you're doing this. Doesn't matter what name you put on it. I don't care about these names at all, but I know other people do. I mean, if you're a certified architect, you really care about architecture, okay? If you're a, a, a strategic planning director, you care about strategy, even though it really is just design or architecture for the organization. So people have their little silos, which is a bad idea. And, uh, but I, I believe in recognizing that every attempt to find, identify, and validate a means for reaching requirements is <clears throat> some form of strategy, designer, architecture, or solution call it what you will. It doesn't matter at all. It matters what it is, not what you call it. Okay. Names are just a distraction here. So I'm going to even call it different names. Uh, actually, what I do is I call it different names, in different cultures. If I'm talking to managers, I only talk about strategies. My value planning book, which is for managers, only talks about strategies. The moment I'm talking to IT people, I might talk about uh, uh, enterprise architecture. Take an example. Now, design theory. Um, here is this function idea in an icon, a, a graphical symbol. Here, as you know, is the value symbol. It's an arrow. Okay. 
Now let me introduce a new symbol. It's a, uh, a rectangle. And a rectangle is the means. Rectangle is a design. It could be any architecture, any strategy, any solution. Uh, it, it could be to use a certain technology or buy a certain box or buy a certain service or implement motivation or follow the law or some strange idea like that. It's anything you do with a view to delivering a value. Okay. Now, on the scale, we have this range I talked about. I'll call it the design area. Here is the level you're at. Let's call it the status. Okay. Here is the level uh, you want to get to. Let's call it the goal. Okay. So here is the design area. You have to design or architect or strategize or solve problems. I don't care what you call it. So that when you implement this in the real system, you move forward towards the goal in increments of agile value delivery steps until you get there. Okay. So let, let's, let's simplify the, any agile project, which is trying to deliver value and has decided how much value they want. That's what we've been talking about up to now has, has to find, <coughs> getting a little horse here, has to find uh, one or more designs that when implemented will get them to the goal. If they cannot find the designs, then there is no known way of getting to the goal. The, the, the value isn't just automatically going to increase itself with no change whatsoever. It is more likely to get entropy and disintegrate and get worse with time. It's called technical debt, in case you didn't know. Okay, So you must have finite uh, concepts, ideas of how to get there. And then uh, you need, uh, maybe one alone won't get you all the way. So you probably need a set. Uh, zero as a set probably won't work. Well, theoretically, in some circumstances, the old set, no new, might work. But, uh, but the set may be any number of designs. It could be 12 or 100 for all I care. But you need to find the set that will get you there. And by the way, once you find the set that will get you there, we get some other questions like, can we afford that set? This is a simple one. Another question is, will this set have destructive side effects on other critical qualities? If yes, you can't use the set, find another set. This is side effect analysis. This is good engineering. Okay, so notice I've explained the concept of design from scratch. I had to work this out myself with graphical symbols, functionality, value, okay, benchmark, target, design area, and the width of the rectangle is the degree to which the design impacts the value. So this design gets us halfway to the goal, all done with pictures, which are the same in Ukrainian, Polish, Lithuanian, Norwegian, and any other language you like. Isn't that nice? We're creating a new notation for systems engineering, in case you didn't notice, but I've been developing it for decades and it's built into language. So yes, Ma, I have designed a graphical icon language for design. And I'm, uh, it, I think this really helps me understand what is design. I mean, this is requirements stuff, and this is design stuff relating to requirements. Um, I, I, I was in Warsaw in Poland at a conference going on right now. Is it scope three or something like that? And I held a lecture, but I met one of the other lecturers there. He's an um, American professor uh, in, in California. And we got to talking over a beer at midnight. And uh, he, he said something like, uh, there is no general theory of design. And I said, what's a general theory? I had no knowledge of this. But he, he then explained what you had to do to have a general theory. You have to have propositions and principles and measures and case studies, a whole lot of academic shit. And I said, 
you, you know what? Uh, I have all that stuff and have had it for decades in competitive engineering. I have a candidate for the world's first general theory of design. It's called Planguage. And uh, I, so uh, he said, oh, that sounds interesting. And I told him a little bit more about it. It sounds, sounds like you actually have one. And nobody in the academic world knows about one, including me, and I'm a professor in the topic. So I, I sent my, this paper off to him, which you can get. He then said, basically, can I put my name on your paper? And I basically said, no, you've done nothing to contribute to it, so I'm not going to play games with you. So long story short, we haven't published it yet. Uh, but if anybody would like to help me publish the general theory of design and they won't steal the idea and claim it's theirs when it's not, we'll play games with them. But the outline for the general theory is in the competitive engineering book, and the general theory itself is right there at that link. But th th that's a fun little thing before we take a break now. I, apparently, I have a general theory of design. Now, that means a general theory of enterprise architecture. That means a general theory of management strategic planning. And general theory is, you know, lots of people have ideas of methods, but they don't have a general theory, and I think I do. But maybe it needs to be validated by some academics who like to validate general theories. We'll see. Anybody like to play the game with me, let me know. So now we'll take a 10 minute uh, break uh, until the hour. And uh, during that break, I'm definitely up for more uh, questions or whatever. Are you having fun yet? <laughs> yep. I hope I've blown I, actually, money. I have a question, Tom. Yeah, so, let's see. Who, uh, who's, who's you talking? mentioned, who, who's so talking? this is Castutus. Uh, yes, I'm please. on the video. Okay. Hello, I'm waving. Yeah, I see, I see now. I, I just... yeah. yeah, hi. So actually, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, yeah, which is obvious. Over time, your system degrades. There's technical depth and all that stuff. But doesn't that mean that some of the value you delivered and you measured to, for example, 42 becomes lower over time and you have meters? Uh, no, okay, let me, let me interrupt you there. There is yeah. a theoretical and practical possibility that it will degenerate or go into entropy. This is the law of entropy of all systems. This is a God's law. Okay? So yes, it can get worse. But there's no law saying it will get worse, which is your question. It may stay stable, and it may increase for other factors. So the answer is, it can go in any direction depending on factors we haven't even discussed. Is that clear? No, and you can observe yeah, this in anything in life. Not really. So, no. okay. So maybe uh, if we go to specific exa example, maybe that would yes, help. Sure. Like for instance, we implemented some system, right? So now we reached the goal and then we say, okay, so goal is reached. Let's not look into that. And maybe there's some kind of technical depth. So to make it more interesting, let's say there's like bigger or really small. Does it mean that after maybe one year, we will no longer have the value or the goal is no longer met. Like, do we have to continue to checking if the goal is still set from time yes. to time? Yes. Simple. Yes. This okay. is true of the universe and the world and medical systems and everything. You have to continually monitor that the desirable value state is still there. And, you and can't if it's not, then you dig deeper and try to understand why it's no longer there yes. and how far yes. it's going. Somebody has so to on. do something about it. Yeah, okay. This is exactly like monitoring COVID-19 and pandemic. You can't, you can't say, oh, we have no more cases. Everybody can party. We see exactly what happens if that happens. This is a law of nature we're talking about. You can observe it everywhere. Your body... Okay, COVID, <laughs> simple. Now, by the way, one reason IT people don't do much about this is they haven't even taken the first step of measurement and quantification at all for most of their values. Once you take that step and you're in engineering territory, you're also in scientific territory, you're in management territory, you can monitor the levels of values and costs. If you have no 
quantified levels of costs and values. You have nothing to monitor, keep on coding and having fun. Which is exactly what my IT friends are doing. Their systems are disintegrating. Technical debt is the greatest proof of all of how little they've ever thought about their maintainability of their systems or designed it in or kept it in. So we wait until 10 or 20 years of degradation of the system and then it's so bad, we throw it away and build a new one. We don't even have a reasonable chance to maintain it and keep it alive for another 20 years because it's gotten so bad because nobody monitored and measured the technical debt. And I still have people who ask me, Tom, can you measure technical debt? I say, yes, and I have Norwegian clients who have been doing it since 2005. Confirm it. Take a look. Okay. But most of so the IT is, people is here... Is there like a, like, all right, so you, you talked about costs, and you have to look at costs, which is like uh, yeah. clear, but I mean... Then you decide, okay, we would leave a little bit of technical depth, for example, not full test coverage or tests or whatever, because that maybe costs too much, right? So how do you make a decision? Like based on costs only or no, system no. criticality? I, I've already given you the answer, but I will repeat it and you say, ah, yes. Okay. Your decision <laughs> should be based on values to costs of your kind with regard to risks of your kind. That's the answer to everything. Okay. Remember, I've been so, talking about that before. Yeah, so your decisions so, uh, about I technical forgot about debt, the risks, so now it's clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your decisions about technical debt are a whole lot of possible technologies, and they all have certain values, they all have certain costs, and they all have certain risks, and, and you need to make your choices based on that. Now, by the way, the area I'm going into now <clears throat> shows you a tool called an impact estimation table, which will help you see those choices, make them visible. So part of the, once you've seen that, you realize, of course, that's what I've got to do to do my technical debt understanding. That is exactly what my friends that confirm it in Norway did in 2005. They used the impact estimation table to manage technical debt. And I can show you even, if you, by the way, you'll see a thing called the confirm it case study. And if you access that, you will see exactly what value factors they use to measure technical debt. Okay. Great. Separate lecture. <laughs> but we're talking really did it long ago works very nicely thank you very much and most people haven't even got the idea you can measure technical debt or you should measure it or you should do anything except this stupid idea of refactoring the code when it gets really bad that's a narrow-minded bad choice and there are about a hundred other better ideas for managing technical debt but the narrow-minded programmer says, oh, yeah, you've got to refactor the code. S silly little boys. Surely women couldn't make such a bad decision. We still have two minutes of the break. Am I wearing anybody down? <laughs> I wonder how many people are left of those who started. <laughs> Actually, if we look at participant count, it didn't change. So, Okay, not bad. I mean, 90% could have left if it was really boring and bad. But I hope you are seeing some of the most advanced ideas you've ever seen. And I hope you recognize that they are. But I'm not going to tell you they're the most advanced ideas you've ever seen. You've got to know it up here. Okay? If you know something better, you tell me. I'm not bragging. I'm just stating fact, as my wife says. <laughs> okay, one, we're... one more short question, but yes. I guess long answer is going to be... Leonard, yeah. What do you think about story points, which are used in Agile everywhere around? Yeah. It's okay. quantification total, of the work. Total waste of energy and time for the large, contract, uh, large projects. 
Uh, this is a world that doesn't understand cost estimation or value estimation at all. And all they can do is count stories. So this is a primitive culture which is useless for serious large systems like health systems. It, it, it's, it, and it's actually over the top and too much for simpler systems. So I don't, I, I just uh, shake my head and say, you know, forget it. This is, this is silly. But you have to know about an alternative to see how silly it is. I'm putting that alternative on the table. And hopefully you see what, why should I bother with, you know, story units and stuff like that. The, okay. Again, read my chapter of 60 pages on estimation in the value planning book to see a more sophisticated, this is just a primitive child's play. They're counting what they can, it's as stupid as the lines of code we used to count to estimate in the old days. It's just a new version of the same bad idea. Thanks, I hope nobody in this uh, meeting does those story points. Oh, they probably counting. do. <laughs> uh, hopefully, hopefully they're first a little insulted by my saying how childish they are, but hopefully <laughs> they start investigating and concluding what the truth is. That's a, for me, that's a separate topic. I'm actually going to go into estimation to a degree before the end of the day, uh, but it will be estimation with respect to values and multiple costs. Uh, you will never see story uh, counts at all in my work. Wouldn't waste my time on it. Tom, just a short technical question. Do yes. you plan to go on for uh, one or two hours more? Two hours. Okay. Th that's the plan. Okay. And anybody who can't do that, they know what to do. And they also know how to recuperate the hours if we get the videos and catch it later. Or they can read the slides or they can read the books. But yeah, we have, a, clear. We, have a, we have a plan to do the until uh, uh, for two hours, yeah. Okay. But nobody has to stay there if they don't want to. Very voluntary. If you don't like what you're hearing, you can have your money back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll uh, restart the lecture. That means uh, I'm looking at all your pictures right now, but I can't do that. Let's see. Uh, put on the current speaker. Okay, so I showed you the general theory of design. I hope that tickles the people who are very interested in design and architecture and who are academically interested to take a, a look at it. But uh, you know, all my ideas there are free and I'm sort of waiting for some help to polish this up and get it to the right uh, circle. It could also be the basis of a new type of enterprise architecture. But there it is. And what it is, you can read yourself. Now, um, uh, so last year I wrote uh, a book called Value Design, which is focusing on the value, uh, uh, sorry, the, the design area, the architectural area. And so that's what I'm going into now. You can have a free copy of that here. And here are the topics. And I'll just try to give you some idea of uh, what I, how I do design. Now here's our value cycle. Um, and uh, so uh, here it says solutions. Now uh, this is your direct design area. Okay? This is basically requirements. This is source of requirements. This is decomposition into smaller designs but it could also be decomposition into smaller sets of values. So it's decomposition so that we get small agile steps. Okay. But, but you know, directly doing the architecture, that's right here. Okay. Now what do we do when we've done the architecture? We make it into smaller architectures so we can do agile. We can do our architectures one small set at a time and learn if it works and learn if it doesn't and things like that. Uh, uh, when we've decomposed, we can then say, aha, uh, I've got some stuff that needs to be done next week. So I'll code it and test it and throw it into the system. So that's the coding and testing next week, your first agile step. And at the end of the week, we deliver. That means we uh, integrate it into the system. Of course, you might be integrating uh, 
uh, with uh, very advanced de DevOps and may, might be integrating it as you develop, but let's not go there for the moment. Now, once you've delivered it to the system, you have the opportunity to measure the values that it should be producing, because that's why you designed it, so it produced some values. So you measure the values, you maybe also measure the side effects that weren't your primary reason for doing it, and you measure the costs that you can measure. Uh, you can't measure all future costs so easily. And you learn whether it's working as expected. If it is not working as expected, you bring in your architect to, in fact, redo the values, try again and see if you can get back on track with your delivery of value and your uh, costs. And you continue this until you have learned that all goals are done, stakeholders don't want any more, and you're done. Okay. I'm, just, I'm just trying to put, place the idea. So up to now, we've been talking mainly about this area, stakeholders and values, but in fact, now we're going to move down to this area, uh, solutions. Okay. okay, so I've already said what is design with using these graphics. Uh, here's a slightly more advanced one. Uh, we, we take a look at the idea of what is a perfect design, an ideal design, and a perfect design would, if this is our goal for our value, a perfect design would give you at least as much as you need, and it doesn't hurt if it does more. So equal or more to the goal. That would be perfect design. There's no imperfection in the value aspect of it. And then uh, another aspect of a perfect design if this is your budget level, a perfect design will not eat up more than your budget. It will be somehow less. Okay, so now we have a simple definition of a initially perfect design. It, uh, the design delivers your goal level within your budget level. Is that not nice and simple? But that's what, that's our criteria for an architect to know, do I have a valid design at all? If your design uses more budget of anything that is not a valid design, it violates the resource constraint. If the design does not deliver to your goal levels, it is not sufficient alone. And you have to have different design or more design to get to your level. And one possibility is there is no design that gets to your level and you'll never reach it. It's technologically impossible, no matter what the cost. Got your mind around that? Here is a design specification. Uh, I, I chose it mainly because it's small. We have so many uh, larger ones from some of my Polish friends, by the way. Uh, and uh, this is from a, a, a master class workshop of five days held in Warsaw on that date. And uh, uh, they decided to tackle the problem of making Poland great again, leadership in industry. <laughs> nice problem. And uh, they have some, they, the first uh, day or two, they've done their stakeholders and objectives. And now we're into about the third day of the workshop and I'm asking them to find solutions. And they found a solution called Polish leadership in industry, which is part of, a larger architectural idea called blockchain verificator. Okay. And here's a description of it. So this is the technical detail. Okay. And here are the three guys working on a three person team. I know them all very well. Uh, Bartosz, uh, Bartosz makes great beer glasses as a hobby. Pavel organizes the uh, uh, WUD in Katowice. And, uh, uh, oh, which Tomas is this? Okay, we'll leave that out for the moment. Okay, so, but, but this is a simple example of a design a uh, specification. They skipped over the short form, the summary, the rough equivalent of an ambition level or headline, and they've simply put it in their detailed definition, which is so specific about specific things that, I mean, you're either doing COBOL or not COBOL, uh, so you don't need a lot of detail. You don't have to describe the whole of COBOL it's, uh, or, or Java or Python or whatever it is, although there are variations of these, of course. It's a fairly specific thing that you're going to deal with. Okay? 
what they're actually doing is uh, 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 having systems for looking at fake news in Poland so that we can get rid of it so we can uh, uh, position ourselves to have better leadership in industry. Okay, but that's a real, uh, for at least the, the workshop class design specification. Um, okay, the basics for valid design. Uh, number one, the design should be talking about the critical objectives. So here symbolically is a critical objective with a goal and we need to talk about designs that are going to get us there. Any other discussion like new technologies that are lots of fun like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, bitcoins, <laughs> okay? If they don't clearly serve a purpose of getting us to our value levels, then you are wasting your time. All discussion must, you must be able to ask the question, what has this got to do with our value levels on time? If related, highly related, we should discuss it. If not, uh, put it in the fun to talk about during the weekend in uh, Facebook section. Now, another uh, basic idea. All concurrent designs, that is the entire set of your architecture, must meet all critical value requirements. They must meet. Let's say you have 10 critical uh, values and 10 critical goals, then you need a set of concurrent means you're gonna, they're gonna be in the same system at the same time, not necessarily delivered at the same time. That may be incremental. But the set of designs you're ultimately gonna have to meet your goals must meet your goals. Surprise, okay? Now, uh, the third item is there are all kinds of constraints, the binary and scalar constraints we talked about, and you, the, the, the architecture must not violate any binary constraint, like it must be legal, and it must not violate any uh, tolerable level, any uh, a scalar constraint, okay? Otherwise, it's violated a constraint, and it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's not a good enough set of design, okay? If we cannot find any valid design ideas for a specific level or to uh, not violate a constraint, well, we have a problem, Houston. It means either your designers are not good enough or there is no such design. Or you need somebody better than your designers, which is the same as designers aren't good enough. You need to ask a more expert designers how to find designs which will do the trick, okay? So if a designer you are employing can't find a design, it doesn't mean there is no design, it means they do not know about one. If the best designer in the universe you can access, the best expert cannot find a design, it might mean it's outside the state of the art. That is, nobody knows about it. And uh, that doesn't mean there is no such thing, but somebody has to get very creative here and invent some new technology and see if it works, you know, like an iPhone interface or something like that. So, uh, okay, um, let's see. And then finally, um, in the, the design area is filled with very many dimensions and very many numbers and very many estimates and very many me measurements. And so long story short, you can't do this by feelings and nice sounding words which you can do with primitive systems and good people. You need an engineering discipline to validate the many designs and requirements and put them all together. Okay, so this is like, uh, what is the environment we must have for uh, large scale, complex, agile uh, systems and design? Uh, here are some questions to ask about a design. I think I'm going to skip those, but they're there. But whenever a design is on the table, here's a little checklist, some of which I've been through, some of which I haven't. But I mean, you've got to ask, what is the impact? You've got to ask, um, you know, can we afford to do it? Now, you might think, well, but Tom, that's just common sense. Surely everybody asks those questions all the time. Let me tell you something. The IT Enterprise architects never ask any of those questions any of the time. That's 99.9% .9 true. Take a look. I can't find 
I, I take a look at their real work, at my real clients, and I don't see them even attempting to ask those questions, let alone answer them. So this is like completely new culture for most people. However, it is completely normal culture for a ser any serious engineering culture. So it's not like it's unknown, it's just that IT people haven't matured to the point and had complex enough systems to do it. So, um, uh, by the way, uh, uh, questions. I, I, the last book I did, a second last book, I did a book called 12 Tough Questions. You'll find it for free download. It's only about 16 pages. And it's, uh, it, it is, in fact, this class of question we can ask about a design. And so if you're interested in the whole area, what kind of good questions should we ask about a design, may I recommend my free book, 12 Questions, free download. You'll find it in the um, uh, references. Okay. Um, let's see. Now, in addition to asking, is it good enough to, to get us to the goals, which is this area, we have to simultaneously ask about design option A, B, and C, how much do they cost? Let's just say design option A, B, and C are equal in getting us to the goal. That's this. So, but we cannot and will not do all three. It's too costly and they collide with one another and only one is possible. So they're mutually exclusive. So a simple choice would be to take the cheapest one of them. Okay, so they're otherwise equivalent, but why not take the cheapest one? Now, if you have a culture like enterprise architecture methods I'm citing, which don't even ask about the costs, you cannot make this kind of decision. And there is a real danger that you will do the most expensive thing without even knowing you've done it. And more expensive is maybe not twice as expensive. It could be 10 or 100 times more expensive. And the people collecting your money, the suppliers, will happily take the money from you hundred times more if you don't ask serious questions and, and you've got to keep control of that yourself. Okay. So long story short, uh, design area requires serious cost consideration numerically, multidimensionally together with simultaneously looking at their values. Um, in addition to making sure number one, it meets the values and it, we can afford to do it, uh, we have to, uh, there, there, there may, for example, let's just say this is security. And uh, 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 here, here's something else. Uh, let, let's just say you have a design for user friendliness and the security design you have is so ultra secure that it destroys usability and it's under the tolerable level. Or in other words, a design is not permitted to have a negative side effect which destroys the goal reaching or the, the uh, tolerable level reaching of any other value or cost. So uh, you know, this is what's called looking at side effects in engineering. It's also called uh, uh, balancing and trade-offs design. But these are engineering culture and I'm recommending the engineering culture but it's amazing how many uh, design cultures in software only look at one dimension and no cost and say, I think that'll be good enough for security, so let's do it. Uh, the discussion regarding the Google, Apple, uh, uh, COVID uh, tracking app is a perfectly good example of throwing words and ideas around to the point where it's total disaster and we don't have an app at all today. Uh, people weren't thinking seriously and they weren't interested in thinking seriously. They should be shot. I have quite a few of my friends in Norway, in top people in IT who agree with me, the people who did that at Simula should be dealt with. Did I say shot? I mean, they just weren't treating life and death in Norway in a serious way. Uh, it's a reminder of the constraints we have. We have constraints on resources, like, well, the budget is a million, but no way can you go over 1.1 million without, you know, violating the law. And performance constraints are, well, there's our, our goal, but no way can you be less than that. Otherwise, you're you know, nobody would want it. 
And then we have design constraints, you know, like it must be designed in, in Lithuania or we won't have it, or it must be an Apple design or we won't have it. And function constraints is it has to have certain functions like uh, automatic tracing of COVID users. And if it doesn't have that, what's it doing here? And uh, condition constraint is like it has to um, be legal and meet the GDPR. So here's a whole set of constraints, but long story short, the systematic architect must know about and have in writing official and clearly specified constraints. And any design they lay on the table has to go through this checklist and they have to certify that this design does not violate any known constraints. And they don't even know what some of these constraints are. They don't have any performance constraints because they don't do it numerically at all. So they're, they're just no way equipped to do this properly, which is why I don't think much of most of the architectural methods. They can't do this, yet logically you must do this to not kill 3,000 people a day in America. Now, before I talk about how to evaluate a design, I thought it was kind of funny to talk about how to not evaluate a design. In other words, some bad practices that a lot of people do. Uh, you'll probably all recognize this wonderful little uh, diagram, so I'll just let it uh, be there. And we'll run through it quickly, and you can use it as a checklist. And hopefully you'll feel guilty because you have used some of these methods to evaluate your designs. Okay, so number one, agile is really popular. Everybody should do it. Therefore, our organization should be agile. See? Or uh, design thinking. Google did it, and Google is a successful company. Therefore, we should do design thinking. Now, do you see the problem in the logic here, number one? We, we try another one. Everybody at Google goes to the toilet once a day. Therefore, if our organization requires everybody to go to the toilet once a day, we will be successful. Okay, this is called cause and effect analysis, number one. <laughs> uh, so th this, uh, it's amazing how often, I mean, like every day, a new thing pops up on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, like, for example, Mr. Goebbels' new architectural idea. And then it may get a, either one or two things happen. A very famous corporation used it once, but dumped it. But it doesn't matter. He says, this famous corporation used it, so so should you, to be as famous as and they are. And it's amazing how many people hop on the bandwagon and do something because other famous corporations used it. And so we get a lot of methods that, in fact, will fail for you, even though they might have succeeded for the others, or are no longer succeeding for the others, but nobody tells you and you don't ask. Okay? So this idea of doing stuff because other people do it, forget it. It's very simple. You should use an agile method to validate it. You can try it out, but measure that it delivers your values. If it does, do it. If it doesn't, don't. It doesn't matter who used it in the whole world. Okay? So uh, you got the basic idea. We've got to stop adopting things because it's the flavor of the month or popular. And Agile just happens to be one of those things, but I could name a lot of other things. Yep. Now, uh, uh, let's take something else. Uh, let's say... Uh, uh, using method X, uh, the system becomes very secure. Now that's what I call, uh, first it's, this is non-quantitative thinking. We've not quantified how secure we want to be. Uh, we've not quantified or estimated or measured how secure it is. We just say, uh, you know, encryption is good for security or something like that. That is very childish. It is certainly not engineering. Real engineers don't do that. At the maximum, you could have this as a working hypothesis for five minutes before somebody says, do it tomorrow and measure it and come back and see if anything is good on our agenda of our value, okay? But, but just generalizing, everybody knows you should do this set of things for flexibility, this set of things for security, 
Uh, you should use UX methods for usability, on and on and on. There is so much junk out there because you people have not learned to think clearly about complex systems and shame on your educational systems because that's the root problem. But even if you have a bad educational systems and it doesn't tell you to think clearly, some of you are intelligent enough to think clearly anyway. So why don't you do it? Okay. Am I being nasty yet? Getting towards the end of the day. So now here's another one. The powers that be think the chief executive officer, the board of directors, your steering committee, they have said, we have got to use, um, uh, let's see, ah, we have to have a digitization problem. <clears throat> the whole Norwegian government, and so is yours, is doing digitization, okay, whatever the hell that is. They're not actually doing anything better for any citizen. Health is not getting better, law enforcement not getting better, but damned if we're not going to have digitization everywhere. Now, that's like the stupidest thing I've ever seen, but guess how much money is being paid for both corporations and governments for doing this undefined value thing called digitization. That's about as stupid as it gets, and it's big, and it's right now. Now, you might say, well, Tom, what can I do about it? The government has decided they're going to digitize the health system. I said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You don't go to them and say, you are stupid. Tom Guild told me to say you're stupid because you're going to digitize the health system. Don't do that. Go in and say, good. We're going to make the health system better, right? Now, if they say, no, no, we're going to make it worse by digitization, then you have an interesting conversation. Okay. So they'll say, yes, we're going to make the health system better by digitization. I said, good. Now, uh, 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 in order to do the digitization for you, I'm the IT guys, I need to know exactly what is going to get better, and I need to know how much better, and I need to know how, when. I need to know things like, what is the capacity for COVID serious patients in our hospitals? What is the reserve capacity? When are we going to have it? That is a definition, as you know by now, of a better medical system for handling the pandemic, for example. So can we have a dialogue of defining the better that our digitization way? Not what you know secretly, but don't bother them with it, is digitization is one strategy or design, which might be generally a good idea for many systems. It might also be the wrong idea totally for some systems. Non-digitization, like motivation or changing laws, might be a better idea than any form of digitization, okay? We don't know yet. You cannot know that digitization is the right solution if you don't know the values you're going to produce and you don't know the costs or budgets or time you have to do it. You have to know values numerically and multidimensionally. You have to know um, constraints specifically. Only then can we discuss whether any form of digitization whatsoever is going to solve our problems? Or maybe the answer is none whatsoever. So when you find the absence of clear quantified values and costs, then it's, not, it's too early to discuss digitization. That's just a stupid, popular idea. Now, by the way, who is spreading this idea? Guess what? the people who are going to sell you the hardware and software and services. You have to do digitization, buy our product, buy our services. This is what Eisenhower called the industrial military complex. It's going to tr try to sell you this stuff. It's very good at it, but it is not in the interest of the health service. It is in the interest of the suppliers. And they're already playing this game with the Norwegian health service of millions of kroner going to the initial studies to PwC with illegal contracting pr processes. That's the government's discovering this. Uh, uh, just sucking money out of the government with a plan to spend eight to 10 years, probably failing totally, and 22 billion Norwegian kroner, which will probably be a 100 billion kroner for nothing. That's one project we're looking in little Norway because of this game. 
So if you want to be ethical, responsible, social, what you do is you walk in and say, I'm glad you want to invest money on making the health service better. I'll help you. Not only that, I'll help make sure that you don't fail, you are not fired as a minister, and you in the short term will look very successful and great. How are you going to do that, they say. I'm going to use Agile to deliver very high numeric value very early next week and every bloody week the rest of the year before the election happens. There's no way you can fail. You're going to look so good, it's incredible. And uh, you just leave it to me. You can just ask every week, how much better did the health values get for the pandemic? That's the only question. Okay. You got the idea? In other words, when they're you know, when it's artificial intelligence or blockchain or digitization or agile, these are just a potential means for getting there. And you cannot have a rational discussion about any of that until the quantified values are stated and agrees and the resource limitations are, and other constraints are agreed. That's the only logical framework for making any serious decision like a government contract for 10 years and 100 billion kroner. Am I clear? Now, here's another one. We have used this design for 100 years or 50 years. It is our tradition. It is Norwegian. We use brown goat's cheese for every breakfast, damn it. Don't tell us not to. Okay. Now, that's fine. And there's a lot of value in that idea of using designs that you know, and you know their costs, and you know how they work. That's great. There's just one problem. They might not work in the future system because things might have changed. Okay? So always use is a good reason for having it as a candidate, a good reason for evaluating it. but. If your value statements are radically much better than you ever had, and your cost and time constraints, think pandemics, we've got to solve the problem in two weeks, not two years, are radically different from what you ever had, it is possible that the design you've always used for dealing with pandemics is not good enough. And you have to have some new technology, new ideas. Look at this fantastic struggle we're still in the middle of, of figuring out what is the problem, what are the values, what are the costs, and should we wear masks or not, and when. We're still in the middle of it all, okay? You know, we don't wear masks in Norway outside of medical situations. You've got to be kidding, okay? The uh, question is, how many people do you want to kill every day, not what is our tradition for wearing masks in pubs, okay? So, uh, you know, get rid of this, uh, in, other words, in other words, use this tradition. We know, the, we know the design, we know the strategy. It is our national tradition. Use it carefully and match it up to the quantified value objectives and, and designs. Got it? Uh, that's enough of that. Now, uh, here's another problem. Why are, I walk in and say, why are you using that stupid design? And they say, that's the best stupid design we know, Tom. And I said, yeah, but it, it won't meet the values at all. I said, yeah, but it's the best stupid design we know, Tom. What's the problem? Well, there are two possibilities. There is no better design, and that's all they can do. And we can find out by asking the best experts in the whole universe if they know of anything better, OK? And we can offer a 50 billion kroner prize if they know something better. It may be worth it. So if you could cure the um, COVID pandemic in one week, and you knew how to do it, how much is that worth? OK? And nobody seems to know, so we don't know the solution. But how much is it worth if you could do it? <clears throat> and we might look back 100 years from now and say, it was so simple. Don't breathe, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> so. I hope you're laughing now. Okay. So now the, the other thing is, uh, you just be, uh, so, so in other words, seeking greater expertise and putting out sufficient reward. This is known as an architectural competition in the architecture engineering business. Okay. 
that, uh, you know, uh, you don't just adopt the design because your favorite local designer did it. You put it out for an international architectural competition and you try to choose the best design for the parameters of the design competition, okay? So uh, in other words, just because we, meaning our local enterprise architect, cannot figure out a better design certainly does not mean there is no better design. And it doesn't even mean you can't find the better design in 10 minutes by looking on the web for a better design, okay? So we have to have a notion of we've exhausted all reasonable opportunities to find a better design. So we either live with this or we give up and maybe a better design will pop up, but it is not available to us this year. And we're, 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 this is the vaccine problem, okay? People are, you know, Trump would like it before the election and everybody else is saying it's not gonna happen before New Year's, okay? The design of the, nobody knows what the right vaccine is. Okay, um, now here's another one. Our favorite supplier, whether it be IBM or PwC or Accenture, recommends using Watson for artificial intelligence. Now they would say that, wouldn't they? Okay, by the way, uh, there is the uh, uh, free uh, download link to the 12 tough questions that I mentioned earlier. Now, we know that when a supplier who stands to earn a lot of money on something recommends something, we have reason to believe they might be recommending it because they can earn a lot of money on it, even though it's no good for us at all. And it's not our best option. They're not going to say, oh, you should use my competitor's op option. It's twice as good at half the price. They're not going to say that. They're not allowed to say it. They get fired for saying it. Okay. So following well-known large-scale uh, recommended suppliers like Accenture or, or IBM, that's stupid. You know, you can listen to what they say. Uh, some of them, like IBM, even historically have tried to be ethical, okay? But you, you basically have to take what they say and check it out. On an, on an agile step. You have to measure whether it does what they say. If it does, good. Then the other question is, is there any competitor who can do the same thing at half, a tenth of the price? Okay, and you can put that out. I mean, just because it works doesn't mean it's the best one because you have all these side effects and other things to look at. So supplier recommends, I mean, if you, you go to a restaurant and ask for the recommendation of wine, they're not going to suggest the cheapest wine on the menu. And if you order by accident the most expensive wine, the waiter is trained to say that was a very good choice, sir. You must be an expert on wines. He probably has the 10% commission for saying that. Now, even worse, our architect has specified that design. Well, let me make a long story short. I am not impressed by any known form of IT architecture. I think they're all could be burned and we do better or just as well. They are worth less. Am I clear? I can say my humble opinion without fear that any of these architects are going to put out a contract on me and eliminate me or try to, they might say some nasty things about me on the internet. I can tolerate that and I can, I'll have a discussion with them. Let them prove that they are better than I say they are. Let them prove that they quantify the values. Let them prove that they quantify the cost. I'm saying they don't, and there are a, a bunch of boxes and balls and arrows and no quantification, no engineering, and uh, we should not use these methods in IT. We should use better methods, and I'm suggesting my systems engineering architecture is available it is free, and if you have a better method, I'll help you with that too. Okay, we need better methods, and they need to be engineering, and that's the end of it. So I, I don't trust any specification from any enterprise architect because I frankly don't think they know what they're doing. Now, you can prove this in a simple way. When the architect recommends architecture A, you can start a chain of reasoning. Which of our quantified values does this satisfy? And if they say, uh, what do you mean, quantified values? <laughs> you say, gotcha, 
you didn't even design towards the quantified values that somebody didn't tell you about. But our chief technical officer did design the quantified security values. And I'm sorry you didn't ask about it, you weren't told about it, and you've just wasted your time on the security design because it has to meet our 95% of catching the hackers within five seconds. Okay, what's that? Okay, so now you can ask very simple questions of the architects proving that they don't know shit. They're not aligned with what the corporation wants and needs. And then you basically say, come back when you've read the chief technical officer's technical values and costs and can address them with your architecture. Then we might talk with you. Otherwise, frankly, you're out of a job. By the way, the main architect and spokesman for the Axon project in Norway was a PwC consultant masquerading as a, uh, a Norwegian government health service. That became a major public scandal in Norway that they allowed that to happen at all. And, and, and surprise, he fed all the contracts to PwC and they've already used a number like two or 300 million kroner just thinking about thinking about it. No wonder the parliament got a little bit angry and stopped everything and started investigating. But that's what's really going on is, in other words, here, here was the supplier specifying the architecture. Guess what? They're gonna specify an architecture that they can build and earn money from in such a way that no competitor can do it. It's almost like they specified the architecture has to be built by PwC people. How, you know, this is getting silly, but this is reality. Now, uh, arguing that it's the cheapest option, uh, that's good, you're at least looking at uh, costs, but of course there are many different kinds of cheap. Maybe they're only referring to the capital cost. What is the annual cost for maintaining it, okay? For example, uh, a, a color printer can be very cheap, but the annual cost of supplying the ink might kill you. I've just thrown away one color printer because of that very factor. It was dirt cheap, but they know this trick of sell it cheap, but then take you on the annual cost, the maintenance cost, the technical debt problem. So this is just a narrow, invalid argument. You know, if this set of all costs are the cheapest and the set of all values are best, that's a good argument, but it is the cheapest option without even referring to the other types of costs, let alone the values. That is a childlike argument. You know, my daddy is bigger than your daddy or something like that. And it should not be done by grown people with large government systems. Other designs would take too long to implement. Now that's the same kind of argument uh, first, it may not be true at all. It may just be, what is the proof? What is the guarantee? And long implementation, uh, you haven't proven that the other ones will actually take longer or yours will take shorter. And maybe implementation time might not be as critical as say annual cost to the, the, the customer or the taxpayer or anything else like that. So again, this is a narrow-minded unproven argument and very dangerous, you know, we're the quickest one. That was the exact argument used for the Smith to stop from Sibula, the, the COVID tracing thing. You know, we'll have, they really thought they were gonna have the first implementation in the world and Norway would beat the world and they were so proud at it, right? But what was the answer? They still haven't implemented the bloody thing months later and others, others have implemented it. So they used that argument and totally failed and, and seriously, they embarrassed themselves and the good reputation of Stimula in Norway. Um, the design is necessary because of another design. Uh, that's called a dependency. And it is not unknown that some people plug in one design knowing that people will have to buy another design. And they're really just tricking you into paying them money and no competitor can do it. This is a very old game that I have seen played for about 50 or 60 years, okay? Now, a good architect will design so that things are not heavily coupled. That's a programming term, tightly coupled. They will design so that the designs are pretty independent and one design does not demand 
the use of another very costly design in the long term. Okay, so let me put it another way. If somebody tries this argument at all, it means you have bad architecture that does not know how to design with independence and that's their problem. They're not trained to do it, they're not asked to do it, they know how to do it, and they're a total waste of time and they're dangerous. Um, on the, there, by the way, is the free download on decomposition by value from the value planning book. Uh, and I talk about decomposition based on independence of implementation. That is for value, in, uh, that is for agile value so that the agile planners can choose anything they want that has good capability. They're not dependent on other steps being delivered. So this, for me, is, it has a lot to do with good agile or agile as it should be. Okay, so simple ways to evaluate and compare designs. Um, now, uh, from the uh, uh, life design book, and this is for sale, it says store, right? So you're not getting a free copy, I think. But, uh, but if, if you're poor and you're a good person, let me know. Uh, but uh, so these are things for doing something as simple as designing your life or your career. You know, we're down to one person for a limited number of years. So I have a thing called an impact opinion table, IOT, which... Uh, is very simple. It says on this axis, I'll take all those values I have, my health, my wealth, my happiness, my career, and my education. And then I'll take all those strategies, I think, you know, like a certain diet for my health and a certain investment strategy for my wealth and certain sh sharing and being nice to other people so they'll be nice to me and I'll be happy. And I'll, I'll uh, do a, uh, make a startup so I get control of my future career and I'll do continuous learning to hell with a stupid three-year education or a two-day certification in Scrum, and, I'll, and that will help my education. So these look like uh, five good basic strategies for this type of thing. Okay? Now, by setting up a table, we're saying, well, I mean, this sounds good, and it might indeed be good, but uh, what if I say I don't really know whether the diet I'm specifying will help my health. It might be a diet which is dangerous for my health. Just having a good diet for other people isn't necessarily a good diet for me. So I put a double question mark saying that's a primary relationship. Diet is the primary design for my health. I'm not saying it should be, but it could be. And so a double question mark means I don't know exactly how good my diet will be for my health values. Let's just say my health value is this. I'm 80 years old and I want to live a healthy, active life until I'm 110, 30 more years, right? And somebody suggested that your diet should be vegetarian, right? Where is the proof that at 80, if I suddenly become vegetarian, I will live to 110? Hmm. Maybe, maybe. Okay, now, uh, same thing here. Uh, there are lots of investment strategies that can make you rich, but there are lots of investment strategies that can make you poor. Where is the evidence that the uh, Bitcoin investment strategy I have will make me wealthy? Okay, double question mark. Okay. Now, uh, long story short, now here's the other thing. The investment strategy I have might be good for wealth, but it might be bad for my health. I might sit up nights tracking the the investments day and night to keep up to date with it. So it destroys my health because of late nights looking at it. So even though I'm doing vegan to help me a little bit, I'm, I'm doing a bad investment strategy which destroys my health. So it has a bad side effect. This is what I'm doing. I'm setting up a situation where we're trying to look at uh, multiple strategies or designs, the architecture of my future life against the value requirements for my life. And what I'm saying is, well, we can just go with all this to see what happens. But a lot of people destroy their life by doing exactly that. Look at all the tragedies of the wrong diet, the wrong investments, the wrong attitudes for being nice to other people, the wrong startup, the wrong learning strategy. And you know lots of people that have destroyed at least years of their lives by having bad strategies here that sounded good when they started. Okay. 
So what I'm saying is we could be a bit more systematic about our, our life design and a table. Now, um, on that table, let me just go to another version of it, okay? On that table, we could use a very simple, uh, well-known nomenclature. If the diet is ex uh, no good at all, I'll do this and we'll take our break. We, we say, uh, we give it, uh, say, uh, three pluses. If it's pretty good, we give a thing two pluses. If it's okay, a little bit positive, we give it one plus. If we have no idea what it does, we give it a question mark. And if it doesn't do shit, we put zero, okay? And if it is negative side effect, if that investment sitting up all night destroys my health, I give it a minus. And if it is really bad negative side effect, I give it two minuses, okay? And I can compute the number of pluses, minus, and zeros and come up with a rating here. So this is a very simple <coughs> rating system an individual might use to sort of take a long, hard look at how he's planning to use the rest of his life for the next 10 years to see what happens to make life better. Now, having said that, and there's a break, I'm going to leave it there. I will talk about what's wrong with this method and better methods after the break. So now we're in 10 minute break time. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So I can, I'll open up my window for everybody. Okay. Yeah. I have one question. Uh, actually, it was already asked in a way, but I maybe want to specify a bit. You mentioned that this approach that you're talking about approach is best for complex projects. I wonder, let's say if we have a smaller project and uh, let's say we're growing up, at what stages, what parts of the EVO methodology you would uh, say we should try? I mean, right. like step by step, like you said that scale is the one the most way, important you know, thing. Notice, notice that in our syllabus and in our slides, I have a whole section on answering this question. How should we start up, right? Now, at the rate I'm going, I might not get there. That's the bad news. The good news is it's in writing in your documentation and you get my full and complete answer uh, by looking at the slides, okay? Now, I will still, it's break time, so I'm gonna give you some really simple answers where to start, okay? So, uh, and my, my simple answer is this. I, th I think you ought to have at least one really critical value which you have quantified. And I think that's where you should start if you have no values that are quantified, okay? And you manage that. Now, wasn't that simple? In five minutes, we can quantify the most critical value. We can say, uh, I know there are 10 other critical values, but I'm trying to be simple. I don't want to complicate my life with nine other values. I don't want to complicate my life with the other costs. I just want to learn if I can manage technical debt, to take a fun example, okay? We know that we have terrible technical debt. We know it's a disaster. What if I set as an ambition level for the great new project, it would have 90% reduction in technical debt from day one. It would cost 90% less per year to maintain the system by design, nothing else. I give you that as a, an example of a, the idea of starting with one value and just seeing if you can learn to manage that. That, by the way, would reduce the cost of operation of all such systems by a factor of about 10 to one. That's big. Okay, cool. Thanks for the answer. Do you have any other questions? I think you can just... Yeah, uh, I have one. Like, should you focus only on one value? Because if some value takes you to deliver to the goal a few years, it would make sense that you should maybe try to deliver or at least push. Yeah. Now, remember, uh, you know, remember the question. The question was simplest way to start up, like this week. You all right? So I was giving that answer. 
I was not recommending you only did one value. I think I've been painfully clear all day, you need to have multiple values. Remember I talked about the top 10 and there were more, but we should maybe limit ourselves to top 10, okay? Mm -hmm. So the answer is, unfortunately, in the real world, there are multiple critical values. So if you don't want to fail on your project, you must deal with multiple critical values. And if you take my advice to the previous question, you only do technical debt, you will probably fail on one of the other nine top values that you didn't do, okay? But the question was, how can we get a start and get some experience? And the answer is, well, the, it's an agile decomposition thing. Do one, do it well, and when you feel confident, add one more, add one more. Maybe in 10 weeks, you've added 10 values. At the end of 10 weeks, you're managing 10 values, okay? Who says you have to wait years to manage the second value? I didn't say that. But you must manage multiple values. You must manage multiple costs. If you don't, you will be in the failure statistic. Full stop. Unless your project is so trivial that a smart person can just whip it together next week. But you, then you don't need my methods. Okay. Yeah, but does it make sense to maybe on a weekly basis focus on one specific, like would a, yes. let's say efficiency, yeah. Yeah. efficiency yeah. So be let's better? Say you have, let's say you have 10 values and the, a great case study of doing this is confirm it in Oslo. They had 25 values and they had four parallel teams and they, the team would focus typically on one value for one week. So that means four values per week in the four parallel teams. Read the confirm it case studies. I mean, that's how they really did it in practice. And they were incredible. By the end of 12 weeks, they successfully delivered 25 extremely competitive qualities. And they did so well, they wiped out their competition and bought them up. That's how good they are. There's a business story there. So yeah, I mean, I didn't say every week you must focus on 10 qualities. I said your project needs to maybe focus on 10 and maybe one a week to really get that done. But when that's squared away, when you've reached your, your goal level, it's time to turn to the other ones. Of course. So Tom, is, very, is, there, is there a case study, um, for the example, that you just gave us? Absolutely. It's called the Confirm It Case Study. It is in the literature references on C-O-N-F-I-R-M-I-T. And I promise you it is there. I also mention it and reference it often in my other works. Has anybody found in the references, in the break, the confirm it case study. If not, I'll find the slide and show it to you. It's there. I guarantee it. There's a little section called diverse little papers and slides and stuff by Gilb. It's not in the, it's, there's not a whole book on it, so it isn't in the books. Can anybody find it? Okay. Did you find it? found on slides. Isn't it that one? You found what? Slides. slides. Yeah, slides are good. The, there are papers and there are slides. The slides are actually the best set of them. And there are research papers from the Norwegian Technical University on it. And the, so I've got lots of papers, lots of slides, but my basic slide set gives you all this information in a practical, you know, Lithuania size project for a startup, which succeeded in practice. And that was so 2003 to 2005, long time ago. So, um, which was, oh, uh, which okay. slide was that? Who found it? Oh, it's on slide 111 okay. in the comments. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank slide you. Slide 111 has the reference to confirm it. Conf and by the way, confirm it is kind of fun. You can meet these people, you can talk with them. They have survived in business since I met them 2003. They've grown, they've been successful, their share price has gone up, and they've, they say they've done it through the Evo method on their website and they have no obligation to say they did it. What more can I give you a proof of these methods? You know, I mean, forget Boeing and Intel, all these American big corporations, you know, in Scandinavia, 
we have done very successful things which are well documented with living people and research projects and papers and slides. And confirm it is a very nice example. Great, thank you. Okay, so that now we're uh, back to uh, the, what, the last hour, right? Yeah. Correct? Okay. So I'll go, uh, I won't even take a break. Uh, at 10 minutes too, I'll sort of begin to wind down and, and ask questions, but we will go to, for one more, more hour. And, um, uh, see, I need to, uh, ah, yeah, okay. Okay, now, I, I showed you what I call a simple impact table. Um, it, it doesn't really, uh, uh, I have a list of what's wrong with the table, what is weak. I mean, it's better than nothing, but better than nothing isn't the same as being good enough for you, for your health service in your country. I would never do this for a serious health system. You know, it's good enough for you. But uh, here's a list of all the things that are wrong here, but I'll take it in very simple terms. We have not quantified the requirements. We have not defined more exactly what these things are, the definition of the design. And uh, these are very rough, intuitive, subjective estimations, which might not be true. So as a, you know, a rough, uh, rough thing for one individual, <clears throat> no harm done. The worst you could do is die 10 years earlier. <coughs> and who cares about that? Okay. So uh, that weakness is... Now, uh, now uh, uh, here's another list of all the things we're missing that I'm going to show you in another table that I think you should use for health services. Uh, uh, but here's the list of all, and I won't go through them. You should be able to read that at this point. Here's a list of all the things you should do in an evaluation table for something as serious as COVID-19 or the health service. Okay. In other words, a lot of methods like quality function deployment and a balanced scorecard uh, actually have this level, bad definition here, bad definition here, and very subjective definitions here. I've written papers on quality function deployments. Uh, they are uh, in your, uh, definitely in your references, and they explain why these widely spread, widely taught at university methods are just shit. Did I make my point yet? Now, by the way, I'm a nice guy. I attack things that I'm willing to, to uh, unlike Trump, I'm willing to see the good points too. So here is a list of all the nice things about bad methods like that. In other words, they are good for a certain class of things if you understand their limitations. I'm not saying never do them. Maybe in life design uh, situation where you're sort of just talking to yourself, it'll help you think and that's fine. Part four, and main thing I want to get through by the time we're done, is uh, more powerful ways to uh, evaluate design options. So enter my impact estimation table. Uh, we sometimes call it a dis value decision table, but it's still the same table, okay? And uh, here is what we do with it, but let me simplify that. We look at alternative or complementary designs, strategies, or architectures. We uh, look at them for the, through the uh, uh, technoscopes. I wrote a whole book called Technoscopes, so look it up. These are tools, like the ones I'm showing you today, for seeing things better. And we look at all these designs uh, with respect to the objectives we have, with respect to the resources we have, with respect to the value to costs, and in fact, with respect to um, risks, which I'll get into in a moment. So that's the basic uh, structure of the table. We also look at things like the total impact of a set of sub-designs. Are they good enough to get all the way to the objectives? Are they so bad they eat up all of our resources? So this is the basic structure of an impact estimation table. And here I'm explaining the structure with a list. I won't go through that in detail, because I did it orally, I did it quickly, and I don't have a lot of time. So if you don't get this in the hour, uh, you can read about it, study the literature, or try to do it. It may take a while. Um, now, what does impact estimation table do? 
Well, actually, it, in the background are the stakeholders who have the values, and here are the values. And it brings in the solutions, and here are the solutions. It brings in the decomposed solutions at a more detailed level, and here they are. It, uh, it looks at, uh, at estimations for development time and development cost. It uh, looks at even costs for delivery down here. It, it, it also, also uh, the measurement we do when we deliver it agile are fed into the table. Let's see. Ah, getting problems going back. Okay. It, it, you, you actually can feed into the table not only your estimates for how good things are theoretically, but you feed directly into the table, uh, confirm it does it on spreadsheets. We'll see that in a moment. And uh, we now use Valplan mostly. We, we can feed in and the comparison, whether we got a positive or negative results for the value or cost is automatic because the table does comparison and it tells you how things are. So if you like, the, the table is a way of integrating everything on the value cycle. Uh, uh, end, of, end of discussion. <coughs> now, here is a, a table chosen because it's very simple, and I, but it's also a real one for United Kingdom National Health Service. It's uh, done by some of my students and disciples from British Computer Society. Uh, and uh, they publish their work as uh, they do. They're bo both of them are finishing off their doctoral degrees in Ireland at this moment. But they built a, uh, a system to move pills, pharmaceuticals, from the storehouses in the hospitals to the patients without giving them an overdose so they died of it. They also told me that this is one of the few documented successful healthcare systems in the National Health Service in England. I don't know if that's true, but difficult to find other ones. Okay, and here are the goals they set, the values. Here are the high level strategies. <clears throat> here are their evaluations, how good it is for saving, for, for delivering values. And then they, uh, they do two things here. Uh, this is the sum of how good the three strategies are in total. 200% uh, means it's twice as good as we need, and 170 means it's 70% more than we need. Uh, this is called having a safety factor, and we insist on designing, over-designing consciously, so that when things go wrong, we have enough design to actually meet 100% of the goal. Here, are they've added up the percentage impact of each of the goals, and so this is a, a number which is the general benefit for all values for this one strategy. And you can see that this strategy is best overall. And uh, this, uh, this, this strategy is uh, uh, the worst one overall, and this is in the middle. So let's just say I have to choose one strategy and only one strategy in my early <coughs> uh, uh, sprints. <clears throat> then uh, I would choose this strategy because when I do it, web cell service, I get good effects on several, uh, three of the four important values. So that's the way of prioritizing uh, based on the overall effect on multiple strategies simultaneously. So notice I'm not just telling you, you should manage multiple values simultaneously. I'm giving you a tool to manage multiple values simultaneously and make choices, choices with respect to multiple values simultaneously, okay? So this is another real case study and real example with named people, named hospitals, named results, and things like that. Now here, in fact, is the confirmant example. And um, uh, what they did, they were using a, a standard spreadsheet. They, in one evening, they built their own tool uh, two years later, they built a more sophisticated tool. Forget that, but they, they built their tool on a spreadsheet. And here's an impact estimation table. This is one of the four teams of four people. So this is a four person team. The team has been given 12 weeks, one quarter of a year. Step nine is then the ninth week. Um, 
uh, by the ninth, they are measuring and getting feedback. They're actually dealing with four usability measures. Here's the past level, the tolerable level, and the goal level. Here is progress to date. Uh, so this is cumulative progress. Uh, this goal is 50% delivered. This sub goal, 166, nothing, nothing, 12 and a half. And uh, re resources are at 91.8. In other words, they have some resources left. Uh, they, what, what the team is empowered to do is say, well, we shouldn't spend any time on that and that because they're already achieved. So they do what I call dynamic design to cost. And they say, aha, on step nine, the beginning of step nine, this particular usability productivity uh, was at zero. And the job was to get something, uh, which is actually bringing out some reports from 65 minutes for the customers every day down to 25 minutes. And so they decided to attack that on the beginning of step nine. They looked at, uh, on a sort of like a stand-up meeting for design, they looked at about 10 different options, one of which was recoding the marketing information. They asked a simple question, can we do it in one week? Yes. And how much impact will it have? And they said, well, uh, it will save 20 minutes, which is 50% of what we needed to do. They need to save 40 minutes. And they said, that's the best single option we have for the four calendar days of our week. Let's do it. So they did it. That means they des designed it, programmed it, coded it, tested it, and delivered it to their system. And they actually got Microsoft at their usability labs to measure it overnight from Thursday to Friday. And Microsoft measured that they saved 38 minutes, which was 95% of their value objective. At that point, the, uh, 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 the, the, the head of the, the, the manager said to one guy, I don't like 95% of goal accomplishment. We have promised 100%. Would you mind working for the weekend? We chose you because you have no family and children and try to get over 95%. He said, yes. He got down to saving of about, uh, I think what it, what it was. It was about 45 minutes. Anyway, it was 12 and percent more than they needed. So they achieved the target of 100 they overachieved it in one week. This is real. And they were, all the teams were doing this stuff in parallel for four person teams every day. So this is, uh, uh, there's the paper on this, uh, since you, if you like a paper rather than slides, okay? Here are the four teams working in parallel on, how many is it, 20, 25, uh, each one of these numbers represents a value. A lot of them are usability, but not, here's testability and here's backwards compatibility and, and uh, uh, things like that, some transfer stuff. So, but the, so each team is working on about 10 values. Here is step nine. If you look at this percentage column, you can see how far this team got by step nine. In other words, almost all of the values they've achieved 100% and stopped instantaneously. Some of the values are already overachieved. Some are damned close. A few are lacking, but they have three more weeks of the 12. This is three more sprints. So what they're gonna do is put their resources behind this particular runtime resource memory users goal, and they're gonna crack it in one, two, or three weeks. At the end of 12 weeks, they seem to always deliver at least 100% of the promised values. Uh, by the way, these teams are empowered to do the detailed design work, not the architecture for everything in confirmment, but the detailed design work. These guys who are engineering graduates, they are programmers, they're actually empowered to find the design and measure their own design and change their design. It's very much like Quinn and, at IBM in, in uh, uh, using the clean room methods. Every step, they're reviewing the numbers for their design, the real numbers, and uh, looking at their cumulative progress towards their designs 
and uh, it, uh, by giving them this power or freedom to find their own designs, their boss is not telling them what the design is, and they're using designs that they measure work, and they're throwing away designs that do not, and they learn a lot of what really works and doesn't work during this period. So this is just the first, after a one day course on how to do this, these are the results they're getting in the first quarter, the first 12 weeks of using it, okay? So uh, naturally, they continue doing this and wiped out their competition, okay? And there's a longer story, but I'm not gonna tell the longer uh, story there. Uh, the continuation of the longer story is after two years of doing this, they said, we have a tremendous technical debt problem. And we think by taking one week every month and not doing the customer oriented values, but just doing the technical debt things, we will crack technical debt, which is very important because otherwise the younger, newer startups will put us out of business because they don't have to worry about technical debt. So here are the names of the things they measured for technical debt, like resource usage, maintainability, uh, synchronization, uh, stuff like that. So they set goals for all of these, and then they unleashed their uh, 16 programmers and testers um, to and gave them the power to do anything they wanted. And there wasn't a lot of refactoring of code going on. It was everything else. And their job was just to bring these numbers up to their goal levels. And they did this one week every month for months on end until they reached this. They used essentially the same engi agile engineering method to crack their technical debt. By the way, this is the first time in history anybody has recorded doing anything remotely like this so it's historic if you know of anything similar i'd like to know about it but i don't okay so now let's see we're uh, not too bad uh okay so moving right along uh here is a, a very detailed impact estimation table uh we're using val plan uh here are one two, three, four values. And below it, we have the cost things. You can't see them on this diagram. Uh, the, uh, the main thing we can notice here is that there's the tag for usability. And there's the wish level, 95% of something. There's the scale. If you want more detail, you click on that hot link and you get all the detail. Same thing here. Here's a, here are various strategies or designs. If you want more detail than the tag, you click on the hot link, you get to see that. But uh, forget all these numbers here for the moment. Here is the estimation of how good is language script for usability. And the answer is it covers 70% of our needs. This is the estimate, the theoretical estimate. Okay. Here is copyright review. It's worth 2%. Here is uh, apps, uh, a, a Apple usability, or a, a copy of the Apple usability, and it has a negative side effect on the goal called copyright law compliance. So we, we measure negative side effects, okay? Uh, let's see, uh, here's, here's a wonderful impact. It says uh, the impact is 100 and, 10%, in other words, this alone gets us to that goal all alone. I don't need the other ones, okay? And so on. So you're looking at a, an industrial scale goal. What are all these other numbers? Well, we'll take a look at them probably before time is out, but uh, they're estimating risks and other things like that, and we'll take a look at it, okay? Um, so, right, so this, is, now you can do this like Confirmit did it on a spreadsheet, or you can do it in a specialized app for my methods like about them. Or you can build your own app. Now, next page. So here is a spreadsheet where we've said, I, I want to see these things, but like most of the uh, Val plan, if I click something which is intentionally condensed to give me overview, I get a window with a lot more detail. So I want to talk to this, uh, this is so this window Every one of these cells is an intersection between 
of means and the ends. And here is more detail, okay? So uh, here is the uh, estimate for how good it's going to be. It's going to save seven minutes. Here's the same, same seven minutes down there. Here's something we haven't talked about before. If you ask a simple question, you say your technology will save seven minutes, but could it be less, could it be more? And most reasonable people say, yeah, I'm not sure of the exact answer, it could vary. Then you say, give me a number. Okay, it could be plus or minus three minutes. That's at least a more honest, realistic answer nobody knows. If you say plus or minus zero, you're either stupid, cheating or you know a fantastic secret about a technology that very few people know okay so i i basically don't believe in plus minus that you have the exact answer uh, you know when will the the uh, pandemic be done when will we have the virus you notice nobody knows they don't even pretend to know but they do say next year plus or minus nine months it's exactly this okay so this is an estimate now, uh, this stuff here is when the results come in, because on an agile step, you've decided to do it. This is registering what really happened. Okay, so this is where the system can say, aha, you're on track, don't worry about it. Or aha, it's much worse than we thought, do worry about it. Uh, this plus minus could be that your measuring method is so bad that you do have a fairly large plus minus, but it was very cheap. Now, when we do the estimates or anything else, uh, we ask a very simple question. You said we're gonna save seven minutes. Now, you ask one of the 12 tough questions that I referred to earlier. What is your evidence? Now, notice that in legal cases and in scientific research, that's a very dominant idea. What is the evidence for the number? So, People uh, usually say, I don't have any, and they'll put their thumb up and say it's a wild-ass guess. You say, thank you very much. Uh, we have a little credibility scoring mechanism here, and you get zero credibility. If you want better than zero credibility, you'd better write down some evidence where people have measured that idea called T kiosk. You know, and, and we have measured it internally. We have several measures, like any good science. So we're now applying a scientific research reporting principle. You give evidence, and bad evidence doesn't get you published and doesn't get you respected, and good evidence is desirable and necessary. We ask a second question. You say this has been done three times. Give me the source. Notice that any scientific or academic paper has a very large number of source references so people can check it out and it has credibility. So credibility is partly, uh, you know, what is the history of how it works? And, you know, are, are, is, is Trump saying this or is uh, uh, Vanucci saying it? Source, you know, who do you trust to tell you about pandemics? And so the combination of evidence and source leads to a rating of credibility on a 10 point scale. 0.0, .0 is bullshit, 1.0 is it's absolutely gonna happen, and something in between meaning uh, it's, it's pretty good. Okay. So by the way, this is our risk handling. The plus minus uncertainty and the credibility evidence and source is how we do two things. We can estimate numerically and in, use artificial intelligence to tell us how bad is the uh, estimation and things like that. The second thing we do, which is far more important, these mechanisms force people like architects to find good technology that has good evidence and good sources. So we get it, we do it right the first time. <clears throat> Once you've been through a management meeting and they've asked the 12 tough questions, and you've gone away red-faced because you have no evidence and you claimed it's gonna save the world, you know, you realize your job is on the line for being a very flimsy architect not knowing what you're doing. And to save your job and feed your children, next time you get a chance, if you ever get one, you're gonna find art, art architecture that has good evidence, good sources, good credibility, low uncertainty, and that's what you're gonna be presenting in everything. And that's what happens. People 
uh, management understands this and likes this very much because now they they are uh, testing the technologists to see how good they are at knowing these are the management goals here these are the management costs these are the techies and architects with stuff that managers don't understand okay this is uh, if you like this is trump's desires and, 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 and this is all this funny stuff about vaccines here, okay? But this is where you get some facts and numbers and above all can ask some really good questions from CNN at the White House. Like Trump, you're going to have the vaccine on 3rd of November. Now, what is your evidence for the fact? And, and, and uh, is your source uh, your, your top medical specialist? Or is it just something Trump believes and hopes because the election is 3rd of November? Okay, so this is how we sort out the bullshit in practice. Managers love this stuff. Uh, one of the next questions is, what about the people doing it? How do they feel? And uh, I'll, I'll give you one very short story. Um, at I mentioned already or in the break the uh, uh, Lou Watt, who got a million dollars first try by using this and it took them a half a day. How do you think they felt? Or actually uh, at Medtronic who builds pacemakers in Minnesota, we taught them to do this. They got a million dollars more than anybody else that group because they use this technique. How do you think they felt about using the technique? People who use it are winners. They find good stuff, they convince managers how good it is they get funded properly like nobody else. So people don't mind doing it if you reward them, if they spend an hour or a day, you reward them with a million dollars, they feel pretty happy about it. Here's another design specification example. There's a rule about designs, which is uh, everybody knows this in building and architecture. If your design is just a high level idea like use bricks, you don't know what it costs and you don't know what the installation properties are and you don't know the, how expensive it is going to be to put them in. But the more detail you specified, the more you know about everything. So in other words, a strategy can't be high level bullshit. It has to be detailed enough that you can get control over the values and costs. And the architects I see don't know that at all because nobody's asking them to estimate and be responsible for any values and any costs. But that's one reason the architects are quite happy with bullshit ideas, like you should use um, design thinking and modularization. Total bullshit. But that's the kind of stuff they actually write down and hand in, and then there's a billion quid project which fails coming right after it. So long story short, we have to get a culture where the, uh, the, the specifications are so detailed that if you follow them, it is more or less guaranteed, plus or minus 10%, that you will get the values you want at the cost you want, just like people in the building industry. Okay, let's see. So um, what can we use this tool for? Well, we can use it for developing architecture. We can use it for evaluating, theoretically, the estimating the architecture. We can use it for presenting the architecture to management. Uh, uh, we can uh, use it for making the architect do things like, uh, gee, all these my negative side effects, I better do something about this stupid architecture. And uh, uh, it, it simply it documents the whole architecture process with how did they arrive at the architecture. It makes the architecture possible to review or quality control. That's the governance of any serious large scale organizations. The architecture I see is not reviewable. You cannot do quality control on it. It's all bullshit. Prove me wrong. Here is the, below the, uh, the value line, these are examples of, I uh, showed part of this earlier. Uh, these are the, uh, the, how much does the architecture cost? So these are three costs for this architecture or four, sorry, four costs for this one, etc. 
uh, by the way, the colors means it's, it's gradually eating up the budget. When it turns red, uh, the use of these would blow the budget, and there's the red budget. This is not eaten up the budget. And there's a safety factor too there. I don't have a lot of time to go into all that, but uh, this is a way of understanding budgeting of a set or accumulation of ideas. Now, anybody can take a spreadsheet, as you know, and uh, turn it into a bar chart. So we've been doing that for years with spreadsheets, but we talked the app into doing it. So here is a set of this architecture, this architecture, another architecture, another architecture. This is the sum of all the values. This is the sum of all the costs. This is the plus minus uncertainty. So this is the least value we can expect, and this is the most value we can expect. This is the uh, least cost we can expect and the most cost we can expect. And what we've done, we've, we've taken these numbers, which are visualized here, and we've, we, we can say things like, um, uh, uh, why don't you sort this in a se sequence for agile? What's that? Well, what about the most value for cost first? And it does that. That's artificial intelligence prioritization. You can do it with a spreadsheet. You can do it with Valplan. And if somebody says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, uh, I noticed that that uh, technique that got to the head of the queue for the most value to cost had a very large uncertainty and other risks. In other words, maybe it's fake news. I want you to sort it with respect to very conservative risk understanding. And bingo, it'll do it automatically for you. It'll tell you with that with regard to the uncertainties and risks, you should, as your first agile step, do this strategy, et cetera. Beginning to get the idea of totally automatic prioritization based on values, costs, risks, multiple simultaneous values, multiple simultaneous costs. Uh, here's another uh, thing from Valplan where we're looking at a whole lot of different Stuff like these are the theoretical things, these are the real things, uh, and, and stuff like that. So, uh, so what we've got here is uh, basically management tools and design tools for uh, only worth using for reasonably large scale projects. And again, if it's three people going to do some coding in three weeks, I don't think I'd bother. But if it's uh, uh, only nine weeks of COVID before everybody in the country dies, I think I would use this on the first week. Okay. I think there's a famous quotation, I only know this roughly by Einstein, if somebody gave me a problem in a week to do it, I'd use 90% of the time thinking about the problem and the rest of the time doing it. So, uh, so this, is, this culture is, is saying, don't dive in and start coding it because you're a, a fast coder and hope for the best. Why don't you use your time to think carefully about what are my values, what are my costs, what, how good are my strategies are, and, uh, and then go into agile mode where you prove and measure the costs and values, and you only scale up with them when, the, when their uh, uh, cost effectiveness is proven. Okay, gee, half an hour left, how wonderful. Um, Obviously, you can simplify a presentation. You can choose, like notice this thing here. It doesn't have all those nasty numbers. This is like a management presentation. Uh, don't even worry about it. Green colors and big bars is good news. And red colors and big bars is bad news. <laughs> That's all you have to know. And by the way, we summed it all up and we'll tell you what to do. Okay, here's that modular idea, the fun of it, but we're rating it, it's more detailed in reality, we're rating it uh, here. Uh, so you can present architectures or management strategies doing it. Let's see, as I recall, uh, I'm getting point where uh, probably enough is said, and so I might look for some highlights that I haven't said much more about. I'm on slide 122, which sounds pretty good. Uh, here's stuff about design decomposition. So uh, here's an elephant decomposed. You all know how to, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Ha, ha, ha. But that elephant was nice and colorful. 
So uh, let me talk a little bit to decomposition. Uh, I have practiced and believed since 1960. On my first real projects in Norway, I delivered projects in 20 value delivery steps. Okay, let's call that 5% steps. Those projects were very successful. I did that intuitively because it seemed to me like a good idea with a lot of new technology and a new domain for me to do things in small steps and measure to real systems, by the way, delivering to real and measure how they worked and make sure things work. So I've been doing that since I was 20 years old in 1960 in Norway. And I can tell you the name of the company and the designs and everything. Now, so I've always believed that a small step is like uh, two to 5%. I've also for years very much liked the idea of weekly steps. Uh, good old friend Agile at least sometimes does weekly, sometimes does two weekly. So they're not crazy. Uh, we, we agree on the notion of how small a step should be. So any big architecture needs to be decomposed into small steps. And let's just say I mean 2% or I mean a week. Just to keep now gigantic projects like uh, the United Nations project for 35 years for reducing poverty, we might think a year was a small step. That's another kettle of fish. Okay. Uh, now, uh, uh, we also have to make the distinction between a value implementation step and a building acquisition step. The agile you are looking at is very focused on what I call building, writing code, writing user stories, use cases, or acquiring stuff. Uh, I, I, this, this has to happen, but I'm very uninterested in it. The programmers are very interested in it. It's what they do. Now, value implementation, let's take it on the extreme. A value implementation step might write no code whatsoever but it might change the salesman's motivation from 5% uh, bonus to 50% bonus. And that might, in fact, make things work better. So in other words, conceptually, in any system, you can do steps to increase the value without writing any code whatsoever. And by the way, people have been doing this for thousands of years, long before there was any code to write. Okay, I was born in 1940, and uh, during the first part of my lifetime, there wasn't a lot of code to write, and everybody did things like run the Second World War, which is a very good example. And they, uh, I just read a wonderful book about the people who um, figured out how to put very intelligent rocket noses so they really could kill off the rockets from Hitler. In, uh, um, damaging London, they actually managed to. They, did, they managed to kill off over 90% of the rockets. And they did that using the kind of methods I'm talking about here. In other words, measurement and evolutionary delivery. And there was no software in the system whatsoever. So the I idea that um, Agile <coughs> is about software. Now, let's just say there's something called Programmers Agile for programming. That's okay. That's probably what most of people are doing. But there is also a thing now called business agile. And there's something called ag uh, systems agile, which I'm talking about. Okay. So there is no presumption that we're going to write any code. In fact, there's no presumption we're even going to have an IT system at all to solve our organizational problems. Maybe yes, maybe no. If IT or software gives the best value for money, then we're going to do. IT or software. If there's something else that gives 10 times the value for one tenth of the cost, we're going to do that and we're not going to do the uh, uh, coding. So the, the scrum we, we, uh, that are building these gigantic uh, e-health systems for Norway and as I understand it, Lithuania, they're all predicated on the idea that some big supplier like Accenture or PWC is going to be writing code every week and building a system there. Sorry, get out of that mode, total waste, make it illegal. There's only one legal activity. It is delivering better health to the Lithuanian population measurably every bloody week. And if you can't do that, 
fire or get rid of all the people who can't do that <coughs> and employ people who claim to do it and can prove every week that they really do it. And I mean, COVID-19 gets reduced every week. You've seen that process in action. We know what we're talking about here. And there wasn't a lot of help from IT helping us do that at all. We had to do it, unfortunately, without the IT help we could have had from tracing apparatus. IT totally failed to step up to the plate and do anything. So now we know who they are. So uh, in other words, to even understand what I'm saying, we have to understand that we're talking about agile value delivery steps. We're not talking about building steps that do not deliver value. You can build and deliver value, that's okay. But you can't build and not deliver value and say, don't worry, in eight years, all this code is gonna provide marvelous value. And eight years go by and the parliament says, your system is irrelevant with regard to European law and new technology. So dump it, forget it, don't ever implement it. Let's start again building a digitization for the 22nd century. I don't know. Um, okay, 20 minutes left. Um, we discovered at some of my clients that although I claimed everything could be decomposed into delivery steps, there were some things that you couldn't decompose because the, um, they weren't legally valid in the country until the government had uh, adopted them. And that was going to take one year, whether you liked it or not. That's going to be the problem with automated driving systems, for example. Um, so we, we discovered that there are certain things, although you may technically be able to decompose them, you still can't plug them into the real system uh, because something some critical constraint factor like uh, uh, government approval to take the simple example already given uh, or uh, delivery of the masks uh, of, of, uh, from some other country, uh, not to mention the breathing machines, it stands in your way. So we discovered what we could do. We could take all those things that could not be decomposed where we simply had to wait or work and we put them in what we call the back room. And in the back room, time elapses until they are ready for delivery. That means ready for integration in the real system. And then uh, we have a step coming up, step 23, and this thing which took 10 weeks is ready. So we say, that's the highest priority. Let's deliver that now. This is very much like a kitchen which prepares the bread and the dessert long before the restaurant opens. But when uh, when the, the customer orders the, the, the dessert, they don't say that will take uh, five hours because we have to freeze it first. It'll say you can have that in five minutes because we did it this morning, hoping you'd order the dessert. And so there's actually a restaurant uh, kitchen uh, analogy here, which is, is very good. But long story short, so we found that restaurant kitchen analogy is a, a very nice way of doing agile delivery of value even though not everything can be uh, uh, decomposed into very small doing batches, and they have to sort of uh, wait around to be managed in the real in the in the back room. Phillips of Holland, who did this with the engines, said, "Tom, you you invented the concept of a back room and front room, but we have such large Phillips supply chains that we in fact have a front room and a back room in the back room." And this can obviously go to any level. I thought that was, I, I never thought that far because I, it took a real industrial customer to point that out. But uh, uh, I'll just give that to you, the idea of a back room or a kitchen. Now, decomposition. Now, in general, what I found is almost everything can be decomposed if you know the methods, that's number one. Um, 5% cannot, and it needs to go in the back room. But most people think that 90% cannot be decomposed, so they're wrong about the 90%. And I've, uh, I've learned through the years why they are wrong and why they can't decompose. Uh, and uh, I've written a lot about it. Uh, the chapter that I 
uh, on decomposition that I gave you a link to a moment ago would be a good place to start. What I did after 10 or 20 years of learning about decomposition on my own and getting no help whatsoever from the universities or the academics is I wrote down the tricks of the trade, here are about 20. I don't have time to go through them, but in the first 20 years taught me that if you use these tricks, you can decompose practically anything. And I'll do the first one uh, just for fun. It turns out an awful lot of people who think they're so intelligent and well-educated that if uh, they, they can't think of how to decompose something in five minutes, they give up. And they say, I'm, I got 20 years of experience. I was talking to a doctor recently. I said, I've operated on 2,000 patients and you don't have cancer. You know what? He was dead wrong. I had cancer. And the fact that he had operated on 2,000 patients didn't matter shit. Okay, so I've learned not to believe people because they think they know everything because they have a lot of experience. Anyway, um, uh, now what we found is if you give it an hour or give it a day and you motivate people and you have some people who know some of these tricks like me or somebody who's read my books, you can 90% of the time find a way of decomposing. In other words, giving up in five minutes is very bad, uh, persisting and using a bit more time and motivation and say, if anybody can find a way of doing it, they get a, a, a caseload of red wine of the best kind. It's amazing how fast people find lots of way of decomposing, okay? So, uh, but in other words, one reason people don't find solutions is they're arrogant. They think they know it all. They, they have a doctoral degree in X and they don't know shit about what they're talking about. They give up and they get everybody else to give up. That is not a smart, strategy. Now I've got 20 more of those strategies. It turns out what I learned is at least one of these strategies will work. So it's a checklist of tactics for finding decomposition when all around you say I can't do it. If I had more time, I'd tell you a, a lot of interesting stories about how people like rocket scientists said it couldn't be decomposed and we did it anyway on the same day. So let me encourage you, if you know the methods and you've got the books, and this is in the book, uh, and you learn the methods and you practice them, you will be a superior being. You will have superpowers. You will be able to decompose things when the guys with 20 years ex more experience than you in a doctoral degree don't know how to do it, and you can do it in five minutes, because that's what I do. Some practical organizational tactics to find good increments. Okay, well, here's a very simple one. Train them in the skills of finding good increments. If nobody's trained and everybody's in denial, it's not gonna happen. How much training do they need? Well, a good day would, uh, would be, and in fact, demonstrations that can be done, followed by a day learning the 20 principles might be a good way of training people so that say, I am a decomposer. I'm a decomposer. I have learned the tricks of decomposing stuff so we can do agile. Okay, I'm an agile decomposist. I'm just making this up as we go along. But in simple terms, you can't expect people to know all the tricks of decomposition who have no experience, no training, no theory, and they're arrogant. A lot of nice people who are arrogant, like the doctor who said, I don't need to test you. I know you don't have cancer. Four weeks later, he was proven absolutely wrong by a Philips Medical Systems scanner, which I helped build. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Now, uh, here's something. This is actually from, uh, if I, uh, I'm thinking we didn't do this in, okay. Uh, a, a lot of the examples I have, they're actually from our friends in Poland. And so I have some nice examples. These are really master classes or training courses. But what I do in, the, in training, and we do this in reality, it's the same thing. I say, okay, we've got some values now. Think about some really hot strategies, maybe some that are people are already in discussion. And here they are. These are the hot top level strategies, okay? And people write them down. Okay, no problem. Then we uh, do the impact estimation table 
and we find the hottest strategies. And let's just say it's this one. And then I say to them, okay, I want you to decompose this into uh, no more than one week of effort to deliver. And when you decompose it, I have two criteria. Number one, it must be uh, 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 um, independently implementable in relation to everything else here. You, can, you don't have to do anything else to make it happen. You can do it this week is what that means. Second thing I ask is when you do it, you can expect real measurable value to happen. And then we do another second level impact estimation table. That's this one. This is all on a two day course sometimes, by the way, in Poland. Poles, Poles are smart enough to do it in two days. Uh, other nationalities require a week or more. Ha, 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 I'm not even joking. And, uh, and then it, it, we, we say, which of these decomposed things has the highest value? And we say, do that next week. We've now chosen a sprint, an agile step, based on two levels of decomposition. Now, this idea of decomposing so that it has value and it is independent is new for most people. They've never heard it. They've never tried to do it. And many of them decompose by with very dependent things that don't deliver value. And that's part of, I have to say, nope, that's not what I'm talking about. Here are the rules, independent and delivers value. And this thing you have there of have a meeting to approve the architecture delivers no value whatsoever and is dependent on the architecture process for happening. So you didn't understand what I said. Drop it, dump it, find stuff that can be done. So you have to have more holistic, realistic, practical things. This is getting very, very practical in the real world. And uh, uh, okay, so, uh, so now we know which of these things should be for maybe this group, the best step they can do in this group, the other, they can work in parallel. These are all done by the way in parallel. In Warsaw, in Poland, we did 60 people in teams of three or four working in parallel for two days and we did all this stuff and they did excellent work and I have copies of it. So I'm, I'm very impressed how fast the Poles pick this up and do it. And my English friends, to be honest, at British Computer Society are almost as good as the Poles are. So, uh, okay. Anyway, that's my uh, quick little venture into uh, decomposition of strategies to deliver value process. Hey, Tom, excuse me. Yes. It's like we're running out of time and I think we, we still need to have yeah. a Q&A session before the end. Yeah. I don't know if you would like to. Finish. Okay, so uh, right, I, I thought my alarm would ring uh, two minutes ago and it didn't. So thank you for waking me up. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Number one, I'm going to stop lecturing. You have the rest of the slides. You have the book. You have enough text to figure it out. You probably overwhelmed with too many ideas. Tough shit. Uh, but give yourself time. And so uh, thank you very much for putting up with me as much as you have. And I look forward to hearing about what you've done with the ideas in practice someday. And now I'm going to shut up and simply listen to questions. I'm looking at all your nice faces. It'd be nice to see them. Yeah, I'm just going to read one question that was in the chat. So yep. Thomas Nielsen said that uh, when you were talking about an elephant, you know, and how do you eat an elephant, he said the husks take longer to eat. So how do you deal with uh, language, culture, and time zone barriers. One bite at a time. So you might, one of your steps might be to implement in one time zone, okay? And then you implement in another time zone, and then you implement in all time zones. That's the decomposition. I, think I mean, you're... that's the simple answer, just dealing with time zones. I can take the rest of the question, but uh, you almost gave the answer by the nature of your question by time zone uh, not sure if you're reading the chat but this is tom you rock 
<laughs> oh, thank Thanks you. a lot. And, hey. and, and I see that we're Welcome happy to, to my be rock here. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have a question. Rock, rock with me. Rock <laughs> with me. <laughs> I, yeah, I, so, I'm not reading uh, the Q&A, so you have to read it to me. I could try and get it, but I'm focusing on looking at people now and listening to questions. Yeah, no problem. So if anyone wants to ask, just you I can... I think Leo the one, wanted to ask the question, right? Yeah, I have actually two, but uh, I forgot one of them. So starting with the first question, um, um, how to formulate this? Uh, at the beginning of the project, you need to gather all those requirements and make the estimation. So how much of that stuff you need to do okay. in the beginning? Now, there is of a subject in your slides, but under the how do we implement, and I'll give you the extremely short version of I'll point to it. I have a method for starting projects that I call the one week project startup for Agile. One week Agile startup, okay? And so you'll find detailed, and I've been practicing this for 30, 40 years, seriously, okay? And it works the following way. Uh, the first day is value day. And by the end of five o'clock on the first day, the team, which is maybe 10 people, has established the top 10 and quantified them with scales of measure and a goal. And they always accomplish that. And that's what we do on all my courses that I mentioned in Poland and Britain and with my clients. We do exactly that. One day, we have a good first draft. We don't have perfect, detailed, final, but we do have 10 critical goals with a reasonable scale of measure done by them, not me, and with a, like a goal level and a pass level. That's Monday. Tuesday is strategy day, architecture day. At the end of the day, we want one piece of paper as output with 10 written ideas, a word or a sentence. And these are the top 10 strategies for getting to the top 10 goals, which we did on Monday. So that, in other words, the output for Tuesday is one piece of paper with maybe at the extreme 10 words on it. We always achieve that, no problem, okay? By the way, the masterclass we've done three or four times in Poland uses this five-day format to teach the master class, okay? Now, Wednesday, guess what we do? The impact estimation table. So, so on Wednesday, we have no other agenda than taking the top 10 strategies and the top 10 values and trying to estimate roughly how good they are and what they cost. And we do that with people who've never learned any of this before we learn it and do it for real large projects. There's, I have a great case study from a U.S. Department of Defense military project, okay, where we did this and we did it on Wednesday, okay? At that point, if you've got good enough numbers, it says, it seems like we have good enough strategies and we won't blow our budgets. Now, let's go for Agile. Thursday is Agile, okay? In very simple terms, the whole day we want maybe one word output. What are we going to do next week with the first value sprint to really deliver real value by improving or enhancing the current existing real system? We do not build new systems from scratch. That's a loser's game. You can spend about an hour discussing that anytime you're ready. Okay? We, you, ha you have to uh, impact the real system and uh, it turns out that at the end of Thursday, we have many ideas, some of which are so simple that people decide to do them on the same Thursday to prove that they work and we can deliver value to the Pentagon. And we really did that. And I've got the whole case study to prove that. Okay. Well, that's four days. What do we do on Friday? We take our crazy plans, which are a culture nobody has ever done before, to the big boss, the brigadier general, the admiral, quite literally, and we lay them on the table, and you know what they say? This is the best fucking planning method I've ever seen, and I learned planning at West Point, and would you get to it right away? And I've got that in writing from generals. 
Okay, so that's, in other words, long story short, if you study the one week uh, project, uh, you know, agile startup week, <clears throat> that is my suggestion for how to start doing it. And you get started rapidly. And the second week, you start producing value. And every week thereafter, you get better health in Norway, measurably, lower COVID. You know, I don't understand this eight years, and then maybe we'll be delayed for eight years. But boy, will we have gotten billions of kroner from the gov stupid government for nothing. I don't understand that at all. You deliver, we've seen it happen in COVID, extremely rapid week by week improvements and changes for some or not. Okay, that's the pace I'm talking about. That's the reality I'm talking about. As somebody put it, COVID has taught us some great lessons in Agile, for real. Okay, and the next question is also related to the COVID situation or um, such an ambiguous situation when you don't know whether your changes affect the situation. So how do you know uh, whether your uh, work you are doing affects the situation, like in COVID times, yeah? You don't right. know how now, much uh, you one, would have. Number one, I've given the answer several times. So uh, you weren't listening, but I'll, I'll, it's okay, I'm patient. And the, the, the second is, we all know this from COVID, the answer. And the answer, as WHO put it very early, test, test, test. Test, 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 measure, 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 every bloody day, every bloody week. Okay, now haven't I given that answer all day? What, what, what? But you don't you know whether during... your actions. What? But you don't know whether your actions impact this. You can test and get uh, lower results, but uh, you don't know whether uh, your work has done that. Okay. Now, we're into uh, cause and effect. We're into scientific research of any kind, very well-known methods. We're into how to prove a vaccine. You know, uh, the, the methods for deciding whether you were the cause and that was the effect is extremely well-known scientific. I'll bet there are at least 90% uh, of everybody listening knows exactly what I'm talking about. They've been trained in it academically, and you have not. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I, I, I mean, I got my first training in sociology at University of Oslo, and I, I began to learn those things. How do you prove the relationship between being alone and suicide from Emil Durkheim in the 1800s? Okay. So the answer is very well known. All scientists and engineers are, know the tradition very well to understand cause and effect in small scale and measure. And I shouldn't have to teach anybody that. If you don't know that, you either need to go on a course on scientific experiment. I'm sure you can get a free one from a good university. Or, uh, uh, or try to do it. Or I don't know. We need to talk about it. But I shouldn't have to teach anybody scientific research or engineering research. I'm simply suggesting we in IT should use science and engineering for a change. OK, thanks. So maybe we can have one last question if it's available yeah, for Tom. Certainly. And, and remember, I, some people are going to think of questions afterwards. And I've given you my email, Tom at guild.com. And I would really love to hear from you. Uh, don't ever feel you're imposing on me. I mean, I've got nothing to do except swim in that fjord, which I did yesterday, by the way, uh, or answer your questions or maybe both at the same time. <laughs> my iPhone is waterproof. <laughs> Apple Watch. So, uh, so please come with the questions afterwards. But yes, let's take that one last thing, as Steve Jobs says. Hey, do you, do we have it, Castutis? Maybe. No, actually, in the chat it's empty, and uh, only like thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. Actually, I'd like to share one thing. Like Benita uh, said that uh, she just started with the Agile and Agile is new for her. So I would, I would say like, a, what a good start <laughs> because uh, <laughs> Tom was telling like, there's so much bullshit, like he says, you know, out there and, and he's presenting what, what's uh, good info. 
So I'd yeah. say Benita, now remember, <laughs> you're lucky remember, you're, you were here. <laughs> remember, I could be bullshitting you. I could be fake news. You don't know. The, the beauty yeah, of what I'm teaching is... Hi, Tom. Hi, everyone. Um, okay. Yeah, that was my comment. And actually, I don't have a lot of questions because I'm just taking in all the information which has to sink in. But um, I wanted to give my feedback on what I heard over the last eight hours. Uh, that was a really amazing um, introduction to what uh, Agile is from your point of view. And I will surely learn other things, but uh, this critical thinking uh, over different systems, uh, Scrum, etc., that the words that pop into my head right now, it's essential to my further study on the subject. So thank you very much. And it was, it was a great time listening to you. Thank you, thank Benita. Benita, Benita, I'm curious. Are, are you are in you Italy? Oh, no, no. I'm in Vilnius. I'm Lithuanian. Oh, oh really? really? Your yeah. name is so, so Italian. Italian. <laughs> true, true. My name is <laughs> but I'm oh, Lithuanian. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay, well, actually, actually this, this uh, somebody needs to turn, turn off, off the feedback the microphone because I'm hearing, I'm hearing myself. myself. Yeah, Benita, if you could mute yourself when you're not talking. Okay, yeah. So um, actually, uh, we said at the beginning, this is for fairly advanced, experienced people who have seen the bullshit. And now, if you walk in and you hear me, you, 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 you're not sure. Maybe I'm the bullshitter and all the other people are talking truth. You, know? and you can't know. So I was going to say the thing. The beauty of what I'm suggesting is this. You can measure in a week or two whether it works or not. I'm not asking you to wait eight years like PWC is asking the Norwegian government to wait for their system. I'm asking you to try for a week to get ready to prove that this Agile works in a week and every week. And that's what it does. So the beauty is you can prove whether I'm bullshitting or not by trying it out. Okay, you can almost do it secretly, under the radar. Nobody even knows you're doing it. And you, you, you don't tell anything until you have the successful, the measurable values in hand. You say, look, I, you know, the, the, health, the COVID is going down in our company. Uh, are you interested in doing more? Well, I'll yes, give so. you feedback later. <laughs> Thank you Looking very much. Thank you very hearing much. From you. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess I would like to thank once again for Tom for wonderful teaching, for the session, for the information and inspiration, and I don't know many other words I could describe. <laughs> uh, and I guess the the how we can measure the success of the uh, this uh, meeting, this call, like. 85 or so percent of people stayed through all Saturday day till this oh point, you know, so <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks and once it's again. Measurable. That's how we measure our, uh, you know, meeting <laughs> success, you know, how many yes. people stay. <laughs> we, we are learning, we are learning already. I, I, I once got a thank you where they simply said, thank you, Tom, for keeping me awake all day. That's so here probably also. remembers that. I'm not surprised she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, good. So, uh, I, I like to be a little shocking, a little dramatic, uh, but I do not exaggerate. But you might think I do. Yeah. So Tom, I believe you will be. We will be able to reach you, and we will have your contacts, uh, as as you mentioned. And one more thanks to all the participants for for being here, and hopefully we'll. Uh, meet in other occasions. Yeah. My wife and I would love to come back to Vilnius and be charmed as tourists. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We, hopefully we will cure the COVID and everything will yeah. be back on track. You know? and everything will be back. <laughs> okay. Oh, any, any last words on behalf of uh, Agile Lithuania, maybe? Uh, yeah, I also haven't learned yet uh, all those words uh, words which can describe this uh, feeling after eight hours sitting at the computer, but it was brilliant, it was wonderful, and there are so many thoughts uh, 
in my head and also i definitely will write you an email inviting you here to to lithuania so i think we will figure out how to bring you in the near future or at least online and I and have <laughs> have your ideas here spread here in lithuania because they are wonderful and i think it's very great things you are telling us so yeah by, thank by you way, very much th thank you Dale. by the way i've learned something there are two kinds of people who hear my methods those who think i'm crazy boring and they haven't got time and we go back to deming survival is not com not uh, uh it, it, survival is uh, voluntary okay i've learned something people who immediately love my ideas and get very enthusiastic they are brilliant people so if 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 you are complimenting me saying how much you thought it was great and brilliant i compliment back you wouldn't be able to say that if you yourself were not mature intelligent uh motivated and good people so i'm so happy to know you and i hope i can pass my ideas the good ones at least on to you thank you very much yeah so thank you all uh tom there are also some messages on chat if you would like to read the uh, participants are saying thank you on behalf you're of gonna themselves you're gonna email me the chat and messages right well, I think we can copy paste that, yeah. Yeah, please, please do. Okay. okay. I so now I will allow myself to say that this call is closed and thanks once again for this occasion and till next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. I I just there is a possibility. I'm I'm going to go swim in the fjord. It's